I think that some people are deliberately trying to completely clear the cultural landscape of our past in order to say there's nothing good, nothing you can hold on to, no one you should revere. You've got no heroes. The whole thing comes down. Who's left standing? Oh, we've also got this idea from the 20th century still about Marxism. And, and no, no, you, you, you will not have the entire landscape deracinated and then the worst ideas tried again. The following is a conversation with Douglas Murray, author of The Badness of Crowds, Gender, Race, and Identity, and his most recent book, The War on the West, How to Prevail in the Age of Unreason. He's a brilliant, fearless, and often controversial thinker who points out and pushes back against what he sees as the madness of our modern world. I should note that the use of the word Marxism and the West in this conversation refers primarily to cultural Marxism and the cultural values of Western civilization, respectively. This is in contrast to my previous conversation with Richard Wolff, where we focused on Marxism as primarily a critique of capitalism and thus looking at it through the lens of economics and not culture. Nevertheless, these two episodes stand opposite of each other with very different perspectives on how we build a flourishing civilization together. I leave it to you, the listener, to think and to decide which is the better way. This is the Lex Friedman Podcast. To support it, please check out our sponsors in the description. And now, dear friends, here's Douglas Murray. You recently wrote the book titled The War on the West which in part says that the values, ideas, and history of Western civilization are under attack. So let's start with the basics. Historically and today, what are the ideas that represent Western civilization? The good, the bad, the ugly. I actually don't get stuck on um, definitions precisely because as you know, once you get stuck on definitions, there's a possibility you'll never get off them. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'd say a few things. Firstly, uh, obviously the Western tradition is a specific tradition, a specific tradition of ideas, culture, well known to be perhaps easily defined by the combination of Athens and Jerusalem, the, the world of the Bible, and the world of ancient Greece and, and indeed Rome. Uh, effectively creates, West, creates European civilization, which itself spawns the rest of the Western civilizations, America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and others. Uh, but these are the main countries that we still refer to as, as the West. Um, so there's a specific tradition and all the things that come from it. Uh, my shorthand cheat on this answer is to say, um, you know when you're not in it. <laughs> so if you've ever been to Beijing, Shanghai, you know you're not in the West, somewhere else, you know you're not in the West. When you're in Tokyo, you're somewhere extraordinary, but you know you're not in the West. Uh, obviously, there are, um, let's say, borderline questions like, is Russia in the West? Um, which I sort of leave open as a, as a question. Um, uh, possibly. If you were placed into Moscow blindfolded and you woke up and you couldn't hear the language, or maybe you didn't know what the language sounded like, would you, would you guess you were in the West uh, or not? I think I was somewhere near it. <laughs> Getting closer. I mean, you know, it's, 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 well, Tolstoy asks the question, doesn't he, whether it's European? And I think the answer to that is not really, although massively influenced by Europe, but um, and times wanting to reach towards it, at times wanting to stay away. But um, but a, a part of the West, possibly, yes. Um, but anyway, I, it's it's a very specific tradition. It's 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 one of a number of major traditions in the world, and. Um, because it's hard to define doesn't mean it doesn't exist. You know? Are there certain characteristics and qualities about the values and the ideas that define it? Is is uh, the type of rule, the type of governmental structure? Yes, uh, I mean, the rule of law, uh, property owning democracies, um, and much more. I mean, these are, of course, things that were ended up being developed in America and uh, then given back to much of the rest of the West. Um, I'd say there are other um, perhaps more controversial attributes I would, I would give to the West. One is a ravenous interest in the rest of the world, which is not shared, of course, by every other culture. Um, 
the late uh, philosopher George Steiner, who said he could never get out of his head the haunting fact that the boats only seemed to go out from Europe. You know, they they didn't. The explorers, the 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 the, the, the scholars, the the linguists, the, the the people who wanted to discover other civilizations, and indeed even resurrect ancient civilizations and lost civilizations. These were scholars that were always coming from the West to discover this elsewhere. By contrast, you we know. There were never boats coming from Egypt to help the Anglo-Saxons discover the origins of their language and, and so on. So I think there is a sort of ravenous interest in the rest of the world, which can be said to be a Western attribute, although it, of course, also has, one should immediately preface it, some downsides and many criticisms that can be made of some of the consequences of that interest. Um, because, of course, it's not entirely lacking in self-interest. So it's not just the scholars, it's also the armies the armies and they're looking to gain access and control over resources elsewhere to market and hence the imperial imperative exactly to conquer to expand yeah. although that itself of course is a universal thing i mean no uh, no um civilization i think that we know of doesn't try to gain ground from its neighbors where it can the western ability to go further faster um certainly gave an advantage in that regard. Do some civilizations get a bit more excited by that kind of idea than others? Possible, it's possible. Because it, you could say it's the Western civilization because the te technological innovation was more um, efficient yes, at doing that kind of thing. Absolutely. But Although, maybe I mean, it wanted it more too. Well, the, the, the Ottomans wanted it an awful lot and did very terribly well <laughs> for many centuries. And one shouldn't forget that. Yeah. Um, as did others. Um, I'd also say, by the way, that, and again, it's a, it's a very broad one, but it's worth throwing out that I think self-criticism um, is an important attribute of the Western mind, uh, one that, as you know, is not common everywhere. Not all societies allow even their most vociferous critics to become rich. So, you know, criticism is a negative sounding word. It could be self-introspection, self-analysis, self-reflection and it can be what you need uh, you know it, and uh, in the western system i'd argue that one of the advantages of the system of representative governance is that you, where there are problems in the system you can um attempt to sort them out by peaceable means um we listen to arguments I mean, most famously in america in the late 20th century the civil rights movement achieved its aims by force of moral argument and persuaded the rest of the country that it had been wrong. Um, that's not common in every society by any means. So I think there are certain attributes of the Western mind that you could say are, um, they're not entirely unique, but they are not as commonplace elsewhere. What about the emergence in hierarchies of asymmetry of power, most visible, most drastic in the form of slavery, for example? Well, I mean, everyone in the world is slavery, so I, mean, I don't regard it as being a Western, a unique Western sin. Um, it's rather hard to think of a civilization in history that didn't have slavery of some kind. One of the oddities of the Western ignorance of our day is that people seem to imagine that our societies in the West were the only ones who ever engaged in any vices. Alas, this isn't true. It's a sort of Rousseauian mistake, or at least one that's blossomed since Rousseau, that uh, everybody else in the world was born into sort of Edenic innocence, and only we in the West had this sort of evil in us that caused us to do bad things to other people. Slavery was engaged in by everyone in the ancient world, of course, and uh, and through most of the modern world as well. Of course, there are 40 million slaves in the world today, so it's, it's clearly not something that the species as a whole has a problem with. Um, that's more slaves, of course, than there were in the 19th century. Um, and I'd say, on top of that, that you know, the interesting thing about the Western mind as regards to slavery is that we were the civilization that did away with it. And and by the way, the the founding fathers of America, who today are lambasted routinely for being acquiescent in the slave trade, um, engaging in it, owning slaves, um, there's not people almost don't even bother now to recognize the fact that. Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, all wanted to see this trade done away with. Couldn't hold the country together at the origins if they'd have made such an effort and believed and hoped that it would be something that would be dealt with 
after their time. So the founding ideas had within them the notion that we should, as a people, get rid of this. The opening line of the Declaration of Independence set up the conditions under which slavery will be impossible. All men are created equal. Once you once you've put that, that's like a that's a time bomb under the <laughs> uh, under the whole concept of slavery. <laughs> that's ticking away. Okay, and sure enough, it detonated in the next century. If we just step back and look at our, uh, the human species, what does slavery teach you about human nature? The fact that slavery uh, has appeared as a function of society throughout human history. There are two possibilities. Um, one is it's what people think they can do when God's not watching. Another is it's what they can do if they think that God allows it. Really, really well put. And uh, the fact that they want to do this kind of subjugation, mm. what does that mean? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward in a way. Um, there are people who get to work for free. It's economic in nature in some, in some sense. Yes, but in order to do it, I mean, almost always, uh, there, the diff there are some examples in the ancient world where this wasn't the case, but almost always it had to be a subjugated people or people that were regarded as different. One of the things actually I've tried to sort of inject into the discussion through this book, among other things, is is a recognition that there was there were very major questions still going on in the 18th and early 19th century that were unresolved, which were one of the reasons why slavery was not as morally repugnant to people then as it was to us now, as it is to us now, and that's the question of polygenesis and monogenesis. Um, at the time of Thomas Jefferson, the founding fathers were, were, were thinking and working. They didn't know, because nobody knew, whether the human races were related or not. Um, the, there, was, there were arguments, that, uh, the monogenesis argument, that, that we were all indeed from the same racial stock. Polygenesis argument was that we weren't. We were you know, black Africans, Ethiopians, they were often referred to at the time, um, because they provided some of the first slaves, um, were different from white Europeans, simply not related in any way. And that makes it easier, of course. That makes it easier to enslave people if you think they're not your brother. Am I my brother's keeper? No, he's not your brother. Uh, and there, there's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very, it was a very troubling argument in the, in the 18th and 19th century, also because there was a biblical question. It threw up, it threw up a theological question, which was, I mean, <laughs> people were literally debating this at the time. Um, was there also a black Adam and Eve? Was there, as it were, an Indian Adam and Eve, a Native American Adam and Eve? I, I, mean, I mean, this was a serious theological debate because they didn't know the answer. And it, it, I mean, people say that Darwin um, solved this. It wasn't just Darwin, of course, but by the late 19th century, the argument that we were not all related as human beings had suffered so many blows that you had to really be very, very ignorant, deliberately, willfully ignorant to, to ignore it by then. So it no longer was, after Darwin, a theological question, it became a moral question. It was already a moral question, but it clarified, Darwin clarifies it, definitely. And then you're in this, as I say, you're in this situation of you're not subjugating some other people, you're subjugating your own kin. And, and that becomes morally unsustainable. So given that slavery in America is part, is part of its history, how do we incorporate it into the calculus of um, policy today social discourse, what we learn in school. We can look at slavery in America, we can look at maybe more recent things like uh, in Europe, the uh, other atrocities, the Holocaust. How do we incorporate that in terms of how we create policy, how we treat each other, all those kinds of things? Um, what is the calculus of integrating the atrocities, the injustices of the past into the way we are today? That's a very complex question because it's a it's a moral question at this point. 
and a moral question long after the fact. Um, I say at one point in the war in the West that the argument, for instance, on reparations now that goes on, and, and it's not a, not a fringe argument anymore. Some people say, oh, you're pulling up this fringe argument. It really isn't. I mean, every contender for the Democratic nomination for the, uh, the presidency in 2020 was willing to talk about the possibility of reparations. Some very eager that this country, America, goes through that entirely self-destructive exercise. Um, I say that there's a, there's a lot of problems with this, but if I could refine it out to one thing, I'd say this. Um, it's no longer about a wealth transfer from one group of people who did something wrong to another group of people who were wronged. It would have been that, it would have been that could have been that 200 years ago. Today, it's not even the descendants of people who did something wrong giving money to people who were the descendants of people who were wronged. It's a wealth transfer from people who look like people who did a wrong thing in the past to another group of people who resemble people who were wronged. That's impossible to do. And I'm completely clear about this. You, you, there is no way in which you could organize such a, a wealth transfer uh, on moral or practical reasons. America is filled with people who are um, have the same skin color as us, for instance, who have no connection to the slave trade and should not be made to pay money to people who have some connection. And then the country is also filled with ethnic minorities who have come after slavery, who would not be um, due for any reimbursement, as it were. The problem, the problem with this is, though, is that there are, it, I'm perfectly open to the possibility that there are um, residual inequities that exist in American life, and, that's, and that the consequences of slavery could be one of the factors that result from this. The thing is, I don't think it's it's a um, I don't think it's a, a single issue answer. I think it's a multi-dimensional issue. Something like black underachievement in America is is obviously a multi-dimensional issue. Um, much of the left and others wish to say it's not. It's only about racism, and they can't answer why Asians who've arrived more recently don't, for instance, get held down by white supremacy. But actually, I say white supremacy in quotes, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but don't get held back by it, but actually flourish to the extent that Asian Americans uh, have a higher household earnings and higher household mean um, uh, uh, equity than home equity and so on than, than white Americans. Uh, so I don't think that on the merits, the evidence is there that you know, racism is the explanation for black, ongoing black underachievement in some sections of the black community in America. Um, it's obviously a part of it. Could you say that even those things like fatherlessness and um, uh, similar family breakdown issues are a long-term consequence of it? it? Possibly, but it's it's being awfully generous to people's ability to make bad decisions. For instance, how many generations after the Holocaust would you allow people to claim that everything that went wrong in the Jewish community was as a result of the Holocaust? I mean, is there is there some kind of term limit on this? I would have thought so. And I think most people probably think that's over. I think the details matter there. The f and... <laughs> um, but it's very We're in difficult. deep waters, yeah. Oh, I enjoy swimming out in the ocean. So, <laughs> although I'm terrified of what's lurking underneath in the darkness, you're right. <laughs> you're right to be. Um, okay, it's really complicated calculus with, with the Holocaust and with slavery. So, the argument in America is that uh, there are, there's deep institutional racism against African Americans that's rooted in slavery. Mm. And so however that calculus turns out, that calculation, it still persists in the mm -hmm. culture, in the institutions, in the allocation of resources, in the way that we communicate in, the, in, the, in subtle ways, in major ways, all that kind of stuff. Um, how is it possible to win or lose that argument of how much institutional racism there is that's rooted in, in slavery, is it a winnable? It's, it's, it's an unquantifiable argument, um, and I, 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 
I, I'd like to apply some shortcuts to some of this, the, the, the following. Are, for instance, all, um, let's take the, the, the one that's most often, often cited. If a, if a white person is walking down a street in America and they see a group of young black men coming towards them and it's late at night and they cross the road, is it because of slavery? Is it because of institutional racism? No, it's because they've made a calculus based not entirely on um, unfounded beliefs that given crime rates, it's possible that this group of people might be a group of people they don't want to meet late at night. That's uh, an ugly fact, but uh, as crime statistics in American cities after American cities bear out, um, it's not an entirely unreasonable one. It's not reasonable every time, obviously, obviously. But is it attributable to slavery? Uh, it's a stretch. Um, if you're in a city like Chicago, where the homicide rates shot up in the last two years, albeit again, as as always has to be remembered, mainly black on black uh, gun violence and knife violence. Nevertheless, if you're in a city like Chicago, and you make that calculus I've just suggested, the, 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 the cliched one, the, the street late at night, there are other factors other than a memory of slavery that kick in. Um, and I'm afraid it's uh, it's something which people don't want to particularly acknowledge in America for obvious reasons, because it's the ugliest damn debate in the world. But I was actually just writing the, in my column in New York Post today about a a very interesting ca case that's sort of similar, which is the, the um, question of obesity in the U.S. As you know, um, America is the most overweight country in the world. Uh, America has, I think, 40% um, of the population is obese in medical ways, and the nearest next country is a long way down. That's New Zealand at 30% of the population. So America's a long way ahead. Why during the coronavirus era, when we know that obesity is the one clearest factor that's likely to lead to your hospitalization if you also get the virus. Why did almost no public health information in America focus on obesity? 80% of the people who ended up hospitalized in America from, with coronavirus were obese. We locked the schools when there was no evidence that the coronavirus was deadly for children. We all wore cloth masks when there was a very little evidence that this was much use in stopping the spread of the virus. We had massive evidence about obesity being a problem, and we never addressed it. Why? Is it just because we worried about fat people? No, it's actually because about fat shaming, as it were. No, it's also because to a great extent, it's a racial issue in America as well. And actually, I quoted this uh, new publication from the University of Chicago, as it happens, which makes that claim explicit. It says, the reasons why people are um, have views that are negative about obesity is because of racism and slavery. This is what everything is drawn back to in America. Anything you want to stop, you say it's because of racism, it's because of slavery. How about it's actually because you mind the hospitals getting clogged up, you mind people dying, you mind ethnic minorities disproportionately dying, and you'd like to say something about it. Once again, as in everything in America, it's cut off by some poorly educated academic saying it's about slavery. So we're really not, I mean, this requires a kind of form of brain surgery to perform it on a society, probably one that's not possible without killing the patient. And it's being done by people who are wearing like mittens. So I'm sure that there's a few folks listening to this that are rolling their eyes and saying, here we go again, two white guys talking about the lack of uh, institutional racism in America. First of all, what's your, what would you like to tell them? So uh, our African American friends who are looking at this, and I've gotten a chance to talk to a bunch of them on Clubhouse recently. Clubhouse is the social app. Yeah, yeah, I know. And I really it's, it's enjoy It's an absolute zoo of an app, as far as I can see. It's, I personally like love it, it mm. because you get to talk to, as somebody who's an introvert, and doesn't socialize much. I enjoy talking to people from all walks of life. 
So it got it gave me a chance to first of all practice Russian and Ukrainian. Hmm. So I get the chance to do that. Then you get a chance to talk about Israel and Palestine with people who are uh, from that part of the world, hmm. and you get to hear raw emotion of people from the ground where they start screaming, they start crying, they start being calm and collected and thoughtful. And the, it, this is as if you walked into a bar with custom picked regular folks, in quotes, regular folks, just people that have quote unquote lived experiences, real pain, real hope, real emotions, biases, and you get to listen to them go at it with no, uh, because it's an audio app, you're not allowed to start getting into a physical fist fight. So mm -hmm. even though it really sounds, sounds like, like people it's, want sounds it. Sounds like it's happening, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, so you get to really listen to that feeling. And for example, it allows a white guy like me from another part of the world, coming from uh, the former Soviet Union, to go into a room with a few hundred uh, African-Americans screaming about mm -hmm. Joe Rogan using the N-word. Oh yeah. And I get to really listen. There's very different perspectives on that in the African-American mm -hmm. community. And it's fascinating to listen. Sure. So I don't get access to that by sort of excellent books and articles sure. written and so on. You get that real raw emotion. And I'm just saying, there's a few of those folks listening to this mm -hmm. with that real raw emotion. Sure. And they, one argument they say is you, Douglas Murray and you, Lex Freeman, don't have the right to talk about race and racism in America. It is our struggle. You are from a privileged class of people that don't don't know what it's like to be a black man or woman in America walking down the street. Can you steel man that case? First of all, fuck <laughs> that. Okay, that's not. That's. Not, I think we need to define steel. Steel manning. Okay. <laughs> Can you try? I know what steel try manning it? is. Um, okay. I really resent that form of argumentation. Sure. I really resent it. I have the right to talk about whatever the hell I want. And no one's going to stop me or try to intimidate me. Yeah. Or tell me that I can't simply because of my skin color. And I think that if I said to somebody else the other way around, it would be equally reprehensible. If I said, shut up, you have no right to criticize anything that Douglas Murray says because you've not got my skin color. Okay, it's not an exact comparison, but seriously, is that a, is that a reasonable form of argument? Uh, you haven't been through everything I've been through in my life, therefore you can't comment. No, in that case, nobody can talk about anything. We might as well pack up, go home and isolate ourselves. Strong words, but can you try to steal me on the case? Not in this particular situation, but there's people that have lived through something that can comment in a very specific yes. way, like for example, Holocaust survivors. Yes. There is a sense in which, maybe a basic sense of civility, when a Holocaust survivor is speaking about their experience of the Holocaust, mm. then um, an intellectual from a very different part of the world is simply writing about uh, nuanced geopolitics of World War II, just, should not interrupt the Holocaust survivor. We but, physically interrupt them if they're no, telling no, their with story. Words, with logic and reason that the experience of the Holocaust survivor somehow fundamentally has a deeper understanding of the humanity and the injustice of the- Well, first of all, I mean, I, again, we're in even deeper waters now, but in terms of wanting to listen to another person who has experienced something, yes, yes but not endlessly, not endlessly. I mean, there are some people who've written about the, I mean, there are people who've written about the Holocaust who didn't experience the Holocaust and have written about it better than people who did. It's, it's not, this, this, this idea that the lived experience, to use this terrible modern jargon, as if there's another type, this, this, this idea that the lived experience has to triumph over everything else is, is not always correct. It can be correct in some circumstances. If you are sitting in a room with a Holocaust survivor and somebody who'd never heard about the Holocaust and wanted to kind of, you know, shoot out their views on it, yeah, one of those people should be heard more than the other, obviously, obviously. If there's somebody who's experienced racism firsthand and there's somebody else who has never experienced it, then obviously you'd want to hear from the person who has experienced it firsthand, if that is the discussion underway. 
I don't think that it's the case that that is endlessly the case. I'm also highly reluctant to concede that there are groups of people who, by dint of their skin color or anything else, get to dominate the microphone. Now, of course, we're literally both speaking to microphones at the moment, so there's an irony to this, but let's skate over the irony. What I mean is people saying, you don't have the right to speak. I have the right to take the microphone from you and speak because I know best. Fine. If you know best, we'll argue it out and someone will win, long or short term. But the the um, the, the, the almost aggressive tone in which this is now leveled, I don't like the sound of. Nobody's experience is completely understandable by another human being, nobody's. And what many people are asking us to do at the moment, us collectively, is to fall for that thing, I think it was Camille Faster who said it first, but I've um, adopted in recent years, is to say, you must spend an inordinate amount of your life trying to understand me personally, my lived experience, everything about me. You should dedicate your life to trying to do that. Simultaneously, you'll never understand me. This is not an attractive invitation. This is, this, this is a, an unwinnable game. So if somebody, if somebody has a, legitimate um, and Im an important point to make, they should make it and they will win through whatever their character is, whatever their race. And by the way, there are plenty of white people who experience racism as well. There are plenty of white people who do and have done, and increasingly so, which is one of the things I write about in the war on the West. I mean, I, I would argue that today in America, the only group who are actually allowed to be consistently vilely racist against the white people if you say disgusting things about black people in America in 2022, you will be over. You will be over. If you decide to talk about people's white tears, their white female tears, their white guilt, their white privilege, their white rage, and all these other pseudo-pathologizing terms, you'll be just fine. You could be the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. You could lecture at Yale University, absolutely fine. And the white people have to suck that up as if, that's fine because there was racism in another direction in the past. So white people can have racism as well. Does that mean that I think that I have a right or other white people have a right to dominate the discourse by talking about their feelings of having been victim, victims of racism? No, not particularly, because what does that get us? It gets us into an endless cycle of competitive victimhood. Am I saying that white people who've experienced violence have experienced historically anything like the violence that was perpetrated against black people in America historically? Obviously not. But, you know, what kind of competition do we want to enter here? And this is very, very important terrain now in America, because there's one other thing I have to throw in there, which is, how do you work out the sincerity of the claim? How do you work out the sincerity of the claim being made? At one point uh, in my book, in this latest book, I referred to a very useful bit in um, in Nietzsche and the genealogy of morals, where, as you know, Nietzsche always has to be treated carefully. You know, when people say, um, "I love Nietzsche," you have to say, "Which bits? <laughs> <laughs> what exactly do you love about him?" But um, <laughs> he uh, and a lot and a lot can be learned from the answer. <laughs> Uh, but there are moments in Genealogy of Morals that were very useful for this book. One of them was the moment when Nietzsche uses a phrase that I've now stolen for myself, or appropriated, you might say, um, where um, where he refers to people who who tear at wounds long since closed and then cry about the pain they feel. Now, how do you know? How do you know whether the pain is real? How do you know? I'm not saying you can never know, but it's hard. So when somebody says, I feel that my life hasn't gone that well and it's because of something that was done to my ancestors 200 years ago, maybe they do feel that. Maybe they're right to feel that. Maybe they're making it up. Maybe they're using it as their reason for failure in life. Maybe they're re using it as their reason to not even try. Maybe they're using it as their reason to smoke weed all day. I don't know. You, and who does know? How can you work that out? And that's why I come back to this thing of who are we 
to constantly judge in this society other people who we don't know and attribute motives to them based on on racial or other characteristics. And as you write in this part, <laughs> I, I like your uh, appro cultural appropriation of Nietzsche uh, and at the same time canceling uh, Nietzsche um, in the same set of sentences. But mm -hmm. you write in this part about evil. No, I didn't cancel Nietzsche. Well, can't cancel Nietzsche, I was, I was saying. <laughs> I'm saying treat him carefully. Treat him carefully, fair enough. <laughs> but you can judge a man's character by which parts of Nietzsche he um, hmm, he quotes. Fair enough. <laughs> I think when you meet people who do Man and Superman a bit too much, you're in... Uh... <laughs> uh, now, now you're pull, pulling in uh, even deeper water referencing Hitler here. Okay, so you write in this part of the book about evil. Uh, quote, what is it that drives evil? Many things without doubt, but one of them is identified by several of the great philosophers is resentment. Yes. That sentiment is one of the greatest drivers for people who want to destroy, colon, blaming someone else for having something you believe you deserve more. And you're saying this kind of resentment, we don't know as it surfaces, whether it's genuine or if it's uh, used to sort of mm. play games of power to evil ends. Um, mm. Can you speak to this, to this, this, because it's such a fascinating idea that one of the biggest drivers of evil in the world is resentment. Mm. Because if you look at, boy, if you look at human history, if you look at Hitler, uh, so much of the propaganda, so much of the narrative was about resentment. Hmm. So is that surface or is it level or is that deep? The resentment that be, drives It evil? can be any of the above. Let's first of all preface it, everybody has resentment. I, mean, I, I, resentment. Just, I use the term resentment, which is, is thought very similar to resentment. Let's stick with resentment. So we don't sound too pretentious. Um, the... <laughs> <laughs> Let me give you a quick example of somebody in our own day who, who has who has a form of resentment. Vladimir Putin. Did you see um, Navalny's documentary, Putin's Palace? Yes. Yeah. You remember the stuff about uh, Putin as a young KGB officer in Germany? Remember the stuff about Putin, his first wife's resentment of one of his KGB colleagues who had a, an apartment that was a few meters bigger than the Putin's apartment? Yeah. It's very interesting. And now, by the way, I'm not saying that, you know, Vladimir Putin became the man he has become and invaded Ukraine because he didn't have an apartment he liked in, Ber in Berlin or Munich, wherever he was. But it's this distinct possibility. <laughs> my, my point is, it, <laughs> my point is, is that, is that resentment is, is a factor in all human lives and we all feel it in, um, in our lives. And it's, it's something that has to be struggled against. The, re resentment is, in political terms, can be a deadly, I mean, it's an incredibly deep thing to draw upon. I mean, you mentioned Hitler. Obviously, one of the things that Hitler played on was resentment, obviously. Uh, almost every revolutionary does. I mean, the French revolutionaries did as well, and not without cause. Uh, There's a good reason to feel that Versailles was not listening to Paris in the 1780s and feel resentment for um, Marie Antoinette in her palace within the palace ignoring the bread shortages in Paris. Um, so resentment is, is a very, it's a very understandable thing, and sometimes it's justifiable, and it's also deadly to the person as it is to the society. Um, it's an incredibly deep, deep sentiment. Somebody else has um, got something that you should have. And the, the problem about it is that it, it's, it has the potential to be endless. Um, you can do it your whole life. And one of the ways I've, I've, I've sort of sort of found myself explaining this to people is to say, it's also important to recognize that resentment is something that can cross absolutely every boundary. So for instance, it crosses all racial boundaries, obviously, and it goes without saying. More interesting is it crosses all class boundaries and socioeconomic boundaries. And if I was to sort of simplify this thought, I would say, I guess that you and I, and everybody watching knows or has known somebody in their lives who has almost nothing, 
in worldly terms and is a generous person, a kindly person, uh, a giving person, uh, a happy person even, a cheerful person. And I think we probably have also, or many of us will have met people who seem to have everything and who are filled with resentment, filled with resentment. Somebody else has held them back from something. Their sister once did something. They said, she shouldn't, she got this and I should have got that. And, and on and on and on. It's a human trait. And what one of the things that suggests to me is that we therefore have a choice in our lives about this. This is something which we can do something about, not limitlessly. But for instance, I mean, there are very good reasons that some people in their lives might feel resentment. Let's say you're involved in a car crash and a friend fell asleep at the wheel and that's why you are spending the rest of your life in a wheelchair. That's a pertinent example of this in American politics at the moment. Um, you would be justified in feeling resentment. And at some point you have to make a decision, which is, am I going to be that person or a different person? But even in that case, you're saying at the individual level and at societal level is destructive to the mind. Even when you're quote unquote justified. It rots still- you. It rots you because the best you can do is to eke out your days unfulfilled. So the antidote, as you describe, is gratitude. Yes. Gratitude is the antidote to evil, in a sense. So Cert- gratitude at the individual level and the societal level. Gratitude is certainly the answer to resentment. I um, I quote in The War in the West, this, 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 but when I read it the uh, first time a few years ago, I was absolutely floored by um, uh, the brothers Karamazov, uh, not everything in it, by the way, I won't get into it, but I have, I have some very big structural criticisms of the novel. Now, now you're just sweet talking to me because I'm a Dostoevsky fan, but okay. I appreciate this. Oh, I, okay. <laughs> well, we could get into what I see as being the structural flaws in The Brothers Caramel. But anyway. Um, now I'm I'm offended and triggered. And yeah, no, I mean, up. this is it's, 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 it's like coming out of Macbeth and saying, ah, I didn't think it was much good. Yeah, there's structural flaws. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought yeah, the ending stank and yeah. <laughs> the middle wasn't very good. No, um, when I read that that, that novel, I was, I was floored by a couple of things. One is, one is, of course, the moment where we realize the devil appears. The moment that Ivan says to his brother, you you know he visits me, and you realize that he's talking about the devil, the whole novel goes into this totally different space. And you realize it's, it's even more than you've already realized the novel's about. And then when the conversation occurs between Ivan and the devil, remember, I think he says it describes him as dressed as a French, as dressed in the French style of the... Uh, early part of the 19th century. Very strange that the devil would be dressed like that, but sort of, um, <laughs> and, and, and if you remember that, that he, and he's sort of cross-legged and rather a Bane figure, but, but the devil mentions in passing to Ivan that um, he says, I don't know why, uh, gratitude is not a, uh, an instinct that's been given to me. And um, yeah, you're not allowed, this is not, uh, given the role of being the devil, this is not one of the things. It's just not one of the things. And, and you think, and, and of course, only a genius of Dostoevsky's stature could, I mean, a lesser genius would have made a whole novel out of that insight. Uh, only Dostoevsky can just throw it away because there's such an abundance of riches that he still has to get through, the structural problems aside. But the, <laughs> but the, but the, uh, the passive aggressive, the the microaggression in this conversation course, no. um, is palpable. <laughs> a little knife fight, kind yeah, of. no. Yeah. But but the, the reason I mention this is because, of course, when I saw this, I thought, I thought this this is such a brilliant insight by Dostoevsky. Because why why would why would gratitude not be a sentiment that the devil was capable of? And the answer is, of course, that if the devil was capable of gratitude, he wouldn't be the devil. He'd be somebody else. He has to be incapable of gratitude. Do you think for Dostoevsky that was as strong of an insight as, as it is for you? Because I think that's a really powerful idea that with gratitude, you, you, you don't get the resentment that rots you from the core. Yes, I think it was one of the just endless things that he saw in us. And, 
And the way I put it is that, I mean, I also think of it in, think of it in terms of the, the era of deconstruction, which is one of the things I'd like us to call the era that's now ending. The era of deconstruction was the era that started, let's say, from the 60s onwards and was originally an academic game that then spilled out into the wider culture, which was, let's take everything apart. Let's pull it all apart. Um, there are lots of problems with it. One is it's quite boring. Uh, you don't get an awful lot from it. Uh, you also have the problem of what children find when they try to do this with bicycles, which is they can take it apart quite easily, but they can't put it back together. Um, and the era of of taking things apart as a game is one we've lived through, and it's been highly destructive. But you can do it for quite a long time. I'm going to look at this society, and I'm going to take it apart by showing systemic problems. I'm going to, at the end of that, what have you got? What have you done? What have you achieved? We need to interrogate this. Okay, interrogate. By all means, ask questions. But interrogate as a deliberate as hostility to this. I'm going to interrogate this thing and take it apart. And again, at the end of it, what have you got? Whether you're interrogating a text or a piece of music or an idea or a society, fine. Question, endlessly question. Yes, interrogate assumes it's all um, a criminal in a cell and it's guilty and therefore it must be taken apart. And that's what we've been doing for decades in the West. And that's resentment. That's one byproduct of resentment. You can't build the thing, but you know how to take it apart. Is a little bit of resentment good? So you have, you know, that uh, I love Tom Waits, and he has a song mm. where uh, a little drop of, po I like my Tom with a little drop of poison. Is it good to do that? A is it good to have a little bit of poison in your drink? Depends what the poison is, and it depends if you know not to have another drink. <laughs> well, it might be the case you find out, as some alcoholics do, that one was too many and ten is not enough. Hmm. So you, there's a natural, in this case, this kind of deconstruction is a slippery slope. It becomes an addiction, it becomes a drug, and you just can't stop. Well, you'd have you have you'd have to wean yourself off it and try to start creating again. Okay, you'd have to start trying to put things together again. Um, something I think might be in the throes of starting as it happens. Well, speaking of taking things apart and not putting them together again, the idea of critical race theory. Mm -hmm. um, can you, to me, explain, so I'm an engineer and have not been actually paying attention much, unfortunately, to the, the, these Thing. None of the people in your field were until it comes along and smacks you in the face. I, you know, I, I've had that line of thinking, and you know, from MIT, I, I said, well, surely whatever you folks are busy about yelling at each other for is is a thing at Harvard and Yale. Hmm. It's not going to. Be yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. <laughs> yes, people in the STEM subjects thought it's not coming for us. It can't come to us. Yeah. And bang. Well, it's you know it hasn't quite been a bang. I'm not Engineering sure. is is more safe than others. Yeah. Uh, so not so. Let's draw a line now between engineering and science. Hmm. So the, I think engineering is uh, I'm uh, sitting in a in a castle in the tallest tower with with my pinky out drinking my martini, saying surely uh, <laughs> the the peasants below with their biology and their humanities <laughs> will will. Figure it all out. No, I'm just kidding. There's no, there's no pinky out. I drink vodka, and <laughs> and I hang with the peasants. Okay, where is this? This metaphor has gone too far. Uh, can you explain uh, to this engineer what critical race theory is? Is it a, a a term that's definable? Is there a tradition? Is there a history? What is good about it? What is bad about it? It is a it is a tradition. It is a history. It's a school of thought. It started in the law, uh, roughly in the 1970s in some of the American Academy. Uh, it spilled out. It always aimed to be an activist philosophy. People deny that now, but as I cite in, in The War in the West, I mean, the, the foundational texts say as much. This is, this is an activist uh, um, academic study. We're not just looking at, at the law. We seek to change the law. 
And it's built out into all of the other disciplines. I think there's a reason for that, by the way, which is it happened at the time that the humanities and others in America were increasingly weak and didn't know what to do, and they needed more games to play or new games to play. The psychologists got bored. Yeah, I mean, that. well, they needed tenure, and they needed, they needed something to do. And, I mean, it's, it's not an original observation. Plenty of people have made this, but, I mean, I mean Neil Ferguson said this some time ago, for instance, that in the last... 50 years in American academia, certainly in humanities departments, when some when somebody dies out who's a great scholar in something, they're just not replaced by somebody of equal stature. They're replaced by somebody who does theory or critical race theory. They're replaced by somebody who does the modern games. Somebody dies out who's a great historian of, say, I don't know, it's the one that's on my mind, um, Russian history or Russian literature, and they're not replaced by a similar... Um, scholar is in his observation and in, in yours is this a is this a recent development it's happened in the last few decades for sure and it's sped up did is it because we've gotten to the bottom of some of the biggest questions of history no it's uh because we're willing to forget the big questions because it's more fun to big questions aren't as well, fun no partly it's a, partly it's no i should stress that partly isn't it's this is in the weeds but partly it's a, it's a result of the hyper specialization in academia sure. um you know, if you if you said you'd like to write your dissertation on Hobbes, <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, if you wanted to, if you something central to Kant's thought or or Hegel or something, I mean, that's not popular. That what's popular is to take somebody way down the line from that because there's a feeling that that's all been done. Mm. So you take something way, way, way down the line from that that's much less important, and then you sort of play with that. And I think most people, anyone who's watching who's been in a philosophy department or anything else in recent years will know that tendency. By the way, there's a very practical consequence of this. I saw this at the end of my friend Roger Scruton's life when he um, he would occasionally, he, he didn't get tenure at uh, universities, but he would occasionally be flown in even by his enemies to teach courses in various universities in basics of philosophy because there was no one in the department able to do it like he would he would he would go in and teach for a semester you know hegel and kant and schopenhauer and others because there was no one to do it because they were all playing with the things way 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 down the road from this yeah. so that had already happened and people were searching for new games to play and the critical race theory stuff forced its way in partly in the way that all of this that's now known as anti-racism does, which is in, in a sort of bullying tone of saying, if you don't follow this, it's the same way that all the things that are called studies, uh, I think everything called studies in the humanities should be shut down. Because of the activist it's an act element. They're all activists, gay studies and queer studies. Um, uh, nothing good has ever come from it, nothing good. To push back, is it is it obvious that activism is a sign of a flaw in a discipline? So is, isn't it- It's a sign of the death of the discipline. It's a sign that discipline's over. But isn't it a good goal to have for discipline to enact change, positive change on the world? Or no. is that to, no. is that that's for politicians to do with the findings of, of, of science, I, I mean, not, not why the create an ideology and then set out to find disciplines that are weakly put together to try to back up your political ideology? So ideology should not be part of I, of uh, of science or of no. Of the I mean, humanities. Why would you? I mean, I mean, anyone could do it. You could decide to go in and be wildly right wing about something and only do things that prove your right wing ideas be fantastically anti academic fantastically anti science fantastic I mean, it, it's an absurd way to to mix up activism and 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 academia and it's absolutely rife and critical race theory is one of the ones that completely polluted the academy yeah, and there's been uh, dark moments throughout history, both for during World War II with both communism and uh, Nazism, fascism that into, um, infiltrated science and then yes. like, corrupted it. Yes, um, I mean, for instance, also, let's face it, in science, as in everything else, there are dark, difficult things. 
it's much better we know about them, face up to them, and try to find a way socially to deal with them than that you leave them in the hands of some activist who wants to do stuff with them. So some of my best friends are activists. So I'm just kidding. Okay. Yeah. None of my best friends are <laughs> activists. That's how it should be. <laughs> well, I was kidding because I don't have any friends. But okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, sure, I'm, that's not true. I'm trying to get gain some um, pity points. Okay, uh, so to return, you have your clubhouse friends <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> screaming away like deranged maniacs. No, I'm anti clubhouse by the way because I, the only time I heard it was that Brett Weinstein one when he did that. I don't know if you heard that like heard early that. in clubhouse. I was invited to clubhouse by various people who said, "Oh, this is a really great civilized way to hang out and talk with inter interesting people." And I, I downloaded the app and I, I got on one night because Brett Weinstein said, "Um, you know, I'm doing this conversation," and I listened, and it was the maddest damn discussion I've ever heard. Was it something about biology? Something about was it co was some, it during COVID times? All that. At kind of some stuff? point, Brett said, "I'm an um, I'm an evolutionary biologist." Mm -hmm. And somebody else started saying, you're a eugenicist. And he said, no, I'm an evol evolutionary biologist. And somebody else was like, that's the same thing. And it just went on like that. And Brett desperately tried to explain that's not the same thing as being a eugenicist. And he lost the clubhouse room. They thought that was the same thing. He'd come. It, it horribly reminded me of a time some years ago when a British newspaper ran a sort of um, realizing that the only thing you can unite people on in sexual ethics is revulsion against pedophilia, ran an anti pedo campaign. And uh, shortly after, um, uh, pediatricians' offices were torched in the north of England by a mob who hadn't read the whole sign. Yeah. Well, to me, um, like I said, a little bit of poison is good for the town. So anyhow, sorry, I inter interrupted you with flattering you with uh, people on Clubhouse. I have many. Friends. I have I have uh, multiples of friends. Yes. Um, <laughs> 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 what we didn't get to some of the ideas of uh, critical race theory. What mm. what exactly uh, is it? I'm actually in part asking this question quite genuinely. Yeah, it's it's an attempt to look at everything among other things through the lens of race and to add race into things where it may not be as a way of adding, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to give the most generous estimation, to add race in as a conversation in a place where it may not have been in the conversation. Um, to, and that means history too? The history oh, sure. of yeah, racism? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, all history. And to look at it through these particular lenses. Um, I mean, there's a certain... Like all these things, there's a certain logic in it. Like, like with feminist studies or something. I mean, is is there a utility in looking back through a undoubtedly male-dominated histories and asking where the the more silent female voice was? Yes, very interesting, not endlessly interesting, and can't be put exactly on the same par as, but it has a utility. Um. It's that endlessly, sorry to interrupt, that endlessly part that seems to get us into trouble yes, a lot absolutely. here. Well, because of this thing of where do you stop? And that's 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 always a, I looked about, talked about this in my last book, In the Manners of Crowds. It's one of the big conundrums in activist movements and particularly in activist academia. Where would you stop? It's not clear because you've got a job in it. You've got a pension in it. You've got, your only esteem in society is in keeping this gig going. What, I mean, is, is there any likelihood? Have you ever, it's the old academic joke, isn't it? That, you know, the end of every conference, the only thing everyone agrees on is that we must have another conference like this one. It's the one yeah. thing they always agree on. This the, conference is going to be so great, we must have another one. Well, that, that's a criticism you could apply to a lot of disciplines. Of course. Uh, civil engineering, bridge building, it's at a certain point, do we need any more bridges? Can we just fly everywhere? <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, <laughs> so at the very least, you need to keep the bridges up. Sure. And they would, and, uh, critical race theory folks would probably make the same argument that at the very least, we need to keep the racism out. Uh, we have that, to make sure yes, we don't descend into uh, the racism. It assumes all the, the time that we are living on the cusp of the return of the KKK. Right. Which is totally wrong. I mean, well, it's a massive. You say, you say that now until the KKK armies march in, 
We don't always, we can't always predict the future. We can't always predict the future. And you, you can always say you should be careful, but you've also got to be careful of people who've got their timing like totally, totally wrong or their estimation of the society they're in. You mean totally, like totally most wrong. of society before in the 1930s when Hitler was, I mean, so many people got Hitler wrong. Sure they did. And so- Most people. So it may, maybe it was nice to have the alarmist thinking there. Well, <laughs> beware of the man with the mustache. Yes. If only it was that easy. Um, it's not always about facial hair. Although, I mean, I always say that. I mean, what? what <laughs> <laughs> it very often is these two so. clean-shaven chaps both say. <laughs> one of the problems of everybody knowing a little bit about Nazism is that they think that they know where evil comes from. And that it comes from like a German with a small mustache getting people to goose step, for instance. And that's not correct. A, a much better understanding of it is it can come from all number of directions and keep your antennae as good as you can. But once you end up in this society, which I would argue certainly parts of America are in, where you're always in 1938, that's not healthy for a society either. Where, where people are so primed and think they're so well-trained because they spent a term in school learning about the Second World War and the Holocaust, think they're so well-trained in Hitler spotting that they can do it all the time. Look at all these phrases we now have in our society. It's like dog whistle. You know, as I always say, if you hear the whistle, you're the dog. But people say, that's a dog whistle, as if they're highly trained anti-Nazis. I mean, you know, there should be some humility in it. We should, we should be careful. We should be wary, for sure. And we should also be slightly humble in our inability to, to spot everything. If not significantly humble. Right. So if we can... <laughs> um, there's something um, funny, if not dark, about the the activity of Hitler spotting, hmm. if I just may take an aside. But uh, so critical race theory, hmm. how much racism, what is racism? How much of it is in our world today? If we were thinking about this activity of Hitler spotting, how, um, and trying to steel man the case mm -hmm. of, if not critical race theory, but people who, who look for racism in our world, mm. How much would you say? Well, let's. it's a good thing to try to define. I'd say that r racism is the, the belief that other people are inferior to you. You could say, you could see a form of it where you thought people were superior to you. That could also happen, but more commonly it's, you see a group of, be of people as being inferior to you simply by dint of the fact that they have a different racial background. And, um, that's sort of the, the easiest way to define racism. Uh, as I say, I mean, there are types of racism, I mean, mainly anti-Semitism, actually, perhaps it's the only one, which weirdly relies on, on a hatred of people who a certain type of person thinks, thinks are better than them. And that's a particular peculiarity, one of the peculiarities of anti-Semitism. Well, anti-Semitism somehow does both, right? Yes, well, one of the, eternal fascinating things about anti-semitism is it can do it does everything at the same time it's like a quantum racism yes You're both superior and inferior you know that you do, do you know um vasily grossman's life and fate so in the middle of life and fate um which a persian friend of mine always said was one of only two great novels of the 20th century she was a very harsh literary critic <laughs> what uh, was the other one? Oh, the leopard obviously the Leopard? The Leopard of uh, Giuseppe de Lampedusa, yeah. Okay. Um, she's definitely right on that one. Yeah. Uh, Life and Fate is, is a- is I'm a, learning so much today, yes. No, Life, uh, and, Life Fate. and Fate is, a, is, a, um, is a, an extraordinary book, mainly about, we well, you know Grossman was a, um, uh, so obviously Jewish himself, but he, uh, he, he saw uh, almost everything that he could have done in the Second World War. He saw Stalingrad, and, you know, a journalist, and he, he, he wrote first-hand accounts of Stalingrad. He, he was also the first journalist into, into Treblinka, 
And his account, which you can read in one of the collections of his journalism, his account of walking into Treblinka is just one of the most devastating, haunting pieces of journalism or prose you can read. Anyhow, I mentioned him because Grossman at the be at the in the middle of Life and Fate, which is about a sort of nine hundred page novel. Um, in the middle of it, which is about the, the dark axis around Stalingrad, uh, he, where at one point he amazingly sort of goes into the minds of both Hitler and Stalin. And he says he says Stalin in his study feels his counterpart in Berlin, and he says he feels very close to him at this moment. Wow! Yeah. Around Stalingrad, like leading up to after, the back after Stalingrad. When the Germans have lost, he says he feels the closeness of Hitler. But Grossman, in the middle of life and fate, slap bang at the worst hours of the 20th century, suddenly dedicates a chapter to anti-Semitism. And I've seen anti-Semitism is something I've always been very interested in uh, because I've always had an, an instinctive utter revulsion of it. And um, uh, also partly because of having seen bits of it. In the Middle East and elsewhere, but uh, I mention this because Grossman, in the middle of, of Life and Fate, has it takes time out and does this like three page explanation, or three page description of anti Semitism, and it's extraordinary. I mean, it's it's a, the only thing I can think of that's equally good is um, uh, um, the Gregor von Retzori, uh, um, who who wrote a, a luridly titled but um, brilliant set of novellas called The Confessions of an Anti Semite, and about pre-First pre World War anti-Semitism in Eastern and Central Europe. Anyway, Grossman says in the middle of Life and Fate that the, 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 one of the extraordinary things about anti-Semitism is that it does everything at the same time. That the Jews get condemned in one place for being rich and in another for being poor. Condemned in one place for, for assimilating and in another for not assimilating. Uh, for assimilating too much and assimilating too little for being too successful, for not being successful enough. So it's, I think it's the only racism that includes within it a detestation, for the real anti-Semite, a detestation of people that the person may perceive to be better than them, correctly or otherwise. By the way, um, I'm embarrassed to say I have not read this one of two greatest novels of the 20th century, Life and Fate, the Zizni Sidba. And just to read off of Wikipedia, Vasily Grossman, a Ukrainian Jew, became a correspondent for the Soviet military paper, Krasna Zvizda, having volunteered and been rejected for military service. He spent a thousand days in the front lines, roughly three of the four years of the conflict between the Germans and the Soviets, and the main themes covered in uh, how's it go? Life and fate. I keep thinking Zizni Sujba mm -hmm. is a theme on Jewish identity and the Holocaust, Grossman's idea of humanity and the human goodness, Stalin's distortion of reality and values, mm -hmm. and uh, science life goes on and reality of war. It's interesting. I need to definitely, you need definitely to read it. Read it. It's, it you'll, I think you'll really get a lot from it. It's one of the other things, sorry, one reference, it, but one of the other things he does is that he, he has this extraordinary ability to, to talk about the, 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 the absolute highest levels of the conflict and then zoom in. It's rather like the camera work they use in things like Lord of the Rings where he zooms down and then gets one person in the midst of all this and you get you, you get on that. Or puts you in the study too. So I, I yeah. personally have read and reread the uh, William Shire's The Rise and Fall of the Third oh. Reich, who's another journalist who was there, hmm. uh, but he does not do it. Interestingly enough, given s such a large novel kind of the definitive work on Hitler, the definitive original work that goes to source materials on on Hitler he doesn't uh touch anti-semitism hmm. really hmm. <laughs> so, big thing to miss out well he just says it very calmly and objectively as he does for most of the work that this was the fact of life there's a lot of cruelty throughout but he doesn't get to well one of the things is, of course, they lost the war because of anti-Semitism. You know, I mean, that's one quite important way to to view it. This how Andrew Roberts and other historians say it is, is that you know, in the end, the Nazis lost the war because they were Nazis. <laughs> it, it sounds almost <laughs> too neat, but it's 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 worth remembering that you know, at the end of the war, when the Germans need to be transporting troops and they need to be transporting very basic supplies, 
Eichmann makes sure he gets the trains to transport the Jews right up to the end. Well, that's that's certainly a dark, a, dark possibility. You know, but anyhow, that, <laughs> but, but to go back to racism in general, yes. racism in general, apart from anti-Semitism, relies on the, the um, perception that another group of people, a racial group, other than your own, are inferior to you. That, that's what I'd say is the is easiest shorthand of racism. And of course, it's one of the stupidest things that our species is capable of. I mean, one of the stupidest, that you can look at a person and guess them in their entirety, in fact, because of their skin color. I mean, it's like, what a stupid idea that is, as well as being an evil one. But the the... the I would say that one of the, I think it's a dangerous thing in our era that there are bits of it coming back. That's why I say we do need sort of, we need our antennae working. We just don't need them to be overactive or underactive, you know. Now the book is War in the West, but speaking of racism, racism towards different groups based on their skin color, you've said that there's a war on white people in the US. Yes. Would you say that's the case? Would you say that there is significant um, racism towards white people in the United States? I'd say that the white people in the United States are the only people who are told that they have hereditary sin. And that's a big one just to start with. Based strictly on, based the color on their of skin, the skin color. I mean, I would find it so repugnant if, and I hope everybody would join me in feeling this, I would feel it so repugnant if there were any school of thought in America today that had any uh, grasp on the public attention, that said that black people were born into evil because of something their ancestors had done, like they had the mark of Cain upon them. I mean, I think it would be such a vicious way to try to demoralize a group of people and to tell them that the, the the things they would be able to achieve in their lives are much lessened because they should spend significant portions of their lives trying to atone for something they didn't do. Is there a difference? And 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 the yes. filling, filling point, the obvious point, left unsaid, but let's say it. Nobody in the public square says that. I mean, they're, they're the maniacs at the far fringes, but nobody in the mainstream would dare to say that, or I think even think that about any group of people other than white people. And does this mean that white people are more disadvantaged than black people? No. And again, let's not make this a competition, but let's not get into, I just desperately urge people not to get into the idea of hereditary sin, according to racial background. Is there something to be said about the feature aspect to sort of play devil's advocate? about the asymmetry of um, sort of accusations towards the majority. So, yes, because white, of course, it's so much the, easier to attack a majority. It is much easier, but is there something to be said about that being a useful function of society that you always attack, um, that the minority has disproportionate power to attack the majority so that you can always keep the majority in check? Well, it's a dangerous game to play, isn't it? I think. It's a very dangerous think, game to I, I play. Think that's a good summary of the entirety of human civilization. Well, yeah, everything is dangerous. Um, but it's a very dangerous game to play that. I wrote about this a bit in The Matters of Crowds when I was saying to like, gay rights people, the ones that still exist, the ones who don't have homes to go to, uh, who want to beat up on straight people in a way, or want to make straight people feel like they're kind of unremarkable, uncool, you know. Boring straights, so boring. So not not like the magical pixie fairy dust gaze. Um, that's a bad idea to push that one. That's a bad idea, and some gays push that. Highly unwise, given the fact that about two to three percent of the population are actually gay. Although now there's like an additional twenty percent who think they're like two spirit or something, and all that bullshit. But they're just attention seekers, so let's not spend too much time on that. But equally, as I've said, I said in the manners of crowds with with uh, the feminist movement, 
very unwise for half of the species to say that the other half of the species isn't needed. <laughs> and there were always third and fourth wave feminists willing to make that nuts argument. Uh, not first wave feminists. You didn't hear it in first wave feminists. You didn't hear it. Suffragettes tended not to say, we like the vote and men are scum. It would have been hard to have won everyone over to their side, not least the men they needed to win over to their side. But you do get third and fourth wave feminists who say, like, you know, do we need men or men are all X? Again, it's a bad idea. It's a bad idea tactically. What if men, Richard Rangham, somebody from Harvard, uh, describes that men are the originators of violence, physical violence in society? Hmm. And he argues that actually the world would be better off. No, just a very cold calculus. If hmm. you get rid of men, hmm. there would be a lot less violence in society, is his claim. But who says you need to get rid of violence in society? Well, that's, but shouldn't that at least be a discussion? Well, I'm very the happy pros to have and the cons. Discussion. Have a debate, on, on a panel discussion, violence, pros and cons. Well, that's the sort of thing, if I can say so, that some like, weak ass academic decides to do because he thinks that his area of Boston would be nicer or whatever. Um, he might decide it's useful if he was living in Kiev today to have violent men. I mean, it might, if, if, um, if New York was invaded right now, I'd need some violent men around here. Hmm. I, I but it wouldn't be invaded if there's no violent men. Well, that's the, ar goes the argument. There's, there's also, at least there's some level of threat that you ought to exude that puts people off. If I was in, you know, I'm very glad that the, that the men and women of Ukraine are capable of, and more than capable of, fighting for their country and for their neighbors and their families and much more. But like, it's better that, that there was violence ready to unleash when violence was unleashed upon them than that the whole society had been told that they should identify as non-binary. But at least it's a, it's a conversation to have, isn't there? Uh, the, isn't there aspect to the sort of the feminist movement that is correct uh, in no. uh, in challenging the some forms of violence, domestic violence, for instance. Although women are capable of that as well. Uh, I'm learning about this. We're all this, learning this is... about this at the moment. <laughs> I can't help but watch the entirety of it go down in this beautiful mess that is human relations. Okay. But just to finish that, that thought, I mean, it's, it's very unwise for women to war against men, as it would be for men to war against women. It's highly, highly unwise to war on a majority population. And in America, Britain, and other Western countries, white people are still a majority. And so why would you tell the majority that they're evil by dint of their skin color? and think that that would be a good way to keep them in check. I mean, I'm not guilty of anything because of my skin color. I'm not guilty of anything. My ancestors didn't do anything wrong. And even if they had, why would I be held responsible for it? So uh, to go back to Nietzsche, mm. is there some aspect to where, if we try to explain the forces at play here, is it the will to power playing itself out from individual human nature and from group behavior nature. Uh, is, is there some elements to this, which is the game we play as human beings, is always when we have less power, we try to find ways to gain more power. That's certainly one. Um, the desire to, to grab is, let me see if I find a quote for you on that. The desire to grab that which we think we're owed and to do it often in the guise of, um, um, justice. I mean, justice is one of the great terms of our age and one of the great bogus terms of our age. People forever talk about their search for justice. And it's amazing how violent they can often be in their search for justice and how many rules they're willing to break so long as they can say that they're after justice and how many norms they can trample so long as they can say it's in the name of justice. You can burn down buildings in the name of justice. Well, the, the majority groups throughout history, including those with white skin color, have done the same in the name of justice. We, we yeah. come up with all kinds of sure. sexy terms in our propaganda machines to sell whatever atrocities we'd like to commit. 
one of the th one of the quotes of uh, from Nietzsche that I liked and I quoted in this. Careful, I'm judging you harshly. Yeah, of course. Um, Nietzsche says that one of the dangers of men of resentment is they'll achieve their ultimate form of revenge, which is to turn happy people into unhappy people like themselves, to shove their misery in the faces of the happy so that in due course the happy, and this is quoting Nietzsche, start to be ashamed of their happiness and perhaps say to one another, it's a disgrace to be happy. There is too much misery. This is something to be averted. For the sick, says Nietzsche, must not make the healthy sick too, or make the healthy confuse themselves with the sick. Well, I think there again, there's a lot of that going on. How could I be happy when there is unhappiness in the world? Why should I not join the ranks of the unhappy? I think uh, Dostoevsky has a book about that as well. Sure. Notes from Underground. Um, okay. This has been very Russian, uh, Russian focus. I'm very pleased with the number That's of times both Dostoevsky and Grossman and others have come in. This is very. I wasn't like doing this as a sort of. Um, yeah, well, it's always good to plug the greats, um, and good to know they're still relevant. Do you speak Russian, by the way, at all? Which I did. I'm told it's a ten-year language, basically, to learn from scratch. As yeah. my friends who have done it. Well, there's the language, and then there's the personality behind the language and the personality I feel like you already have. So you just need to know the surface details. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, in fact, the silence to be silent in the Russian language is something that's already important. Oh, I should, if we had a moment, I'd tell you my story about Stalin's birthplace. Should I tell you that? No. I once went to Gori where Stalin was mm -hmm. born. Have you been? No, no. It's really, I, I was there just after the Georgia war. I went went to the no man's land in South Ossetia and uh, Abkhazia, and uh, I said, "I really got to go to Gori or somewhere because a shell had landed in Gori rather weirdly from the Russian side, and Gori is where Stalin was born, and uh, of course Gori is in Georgia, and uh, um, anyhow, the, the museum of Stalin's birthplace they'd been trying to change for some years because it had been <laughs> unadulteratedly pro-Stalin for years." And the Georgian authorities, this is in Shakashvili's uh, um, uh, time, were trying to make it into a museum of Stalinism. And it was really tough. The only place I've seen which is similar is the house in Mexico City where Trotsky was killed. Mm. Uh, that also is like they're not quite sure what to do. They, they don't want to say he's a bad guy because they think that people won't come anyhow. Um, the Stalin's house in Gori had changed from the Museum of Stalin to the Museum of Stalinism. And there was this large Georgian woman with a pink pencil who just had clearly been doing the tour for like 50 years. And just pointed all the facts. And she did that classic thing. I also saw it once in North Korea where they, that sort of, that sort of communist thing where they say, here is, a, this is 147 feet high by 13 feet deep. And it like give you lots of facts. Like, I don't care. Yeah. What does it matter? Yeah. Um, they always give you facts. Like that. Yeah. This is Stalin's suitcase. It is uh, 13 uh, inches wide by, you know, this isn't. Anyhow, and uh, this woman did all of this, and it was all just wildly pro, well, not pro Stalin, it was just explaining Stalin's lives. It was just a great local boy done good. Uh, they didn't mention the fact he killed more Georgians per capita than anyone else. <laughs> local boy done good. And we get, get to the end, and before being taken to the gift shop where they sell red wine with Stalin's face on it, and among other things, and a lighter for, with Stalin on it. Uh, they uh, they took you to a little room under the stairs, and they said, "This is a replica of interrogation cell to show uh, uh, represent horror of what happened in Stalin time." Uh, now, a gift shop. And so, <laughs> there's no no kind of. And I, and I took the woman aside at the, at the end. I discovered she'd said this to other journalists and visited before. I took her aside and I said, "I said, what, what do you think about Comrade Stalin?" And she said, um, as I say, she'd obviously done this during communist times. She said, it's not my, not my place to judge, you know, sort of thing. Hmm. Which is an interesting comment in itself. I said, yeah, but he killed more Georgians than anyone, you know, and, and all that sort of thing. And she said, it's not my place to judge or to give my views and that sort of thing. And eventually I said, but what do you feel about it? And she said, um, it was like a hurricane. It happened. Hmm. That's interesting because uh, if I may mention Clubhouse once again, 
I got a chance to talk to a few people from Mongolia. Mm. There's a woman from Mongolia, and they talked about the fact that they deeply admire Stalin. Mm. I love. She she sounded, if I may, hopefully that's not crossing line. I think I'm representing her correctly in saying she, she admired him almost like, um, like loved him, like the people the way yes. people love like a, a, a like a, a like Jesus, like a, yes. a holy figure. Well, isn't that still, still the case in large parts of Russia? Yeah, I mean, he keeps on Stalin keeps on winning greatest Russian of all time. And and that's perhaps maybe there's a dip, but if we were to think about the long arc of history, perhaps that's going to go up and up and up and up. As yeah. there's something about human memory that it just you forget the details of the atrocities of the past and remember the. I mean, think of the number of people we talk about as historical heroes. Napoleon. Yeah. I mean, British people don't talk about Napoleon as a hero, but Churchill. the French. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, a now you're. Now you did now the thing, the Dostoevsky. Now again, now you're on to... tricky ground. But no, but I, like the the the, the French are oh, enormously my Napoleon, and uh, they had many admirable aspects. He was also an uh, unbelievable brute and um, killed many people unnecessarily. And um, there are lots of figures from history that we sort of cover that over with. Yeah, yeah. Can we mention Churchill briefly? Sure. Because uh, he is one of the, um, you could make a case for him being one of the great representers or great figures historically of the Western civilization. Yes. And then there's a lot of people uh, from, not a lot. <laughs> I know, I have like three friends and one of one of them happens to be from London. And they, they say that he's a, a uh, um, not a good person. Why? Is, so listen, this friend would, would not discuss. I just this is an opinion poll of the three friends, but I do know that there's quite a bit. You know, there's a backlash going on at the moment. At the moment, and in general, there's a spirit like uh, reflecting on on the darker sides of some of these historical figures, like challenging history through. It's it's not just critical race theory. It's 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 challenging history through. Well, uh, are the people we think of as heroes what are their flaws and are they in sure. fact villains that are convenient um sort of uh were there at the right time to accidentally do the right thing accidentally <laughs> well, you're, you're, i hope this isn't the representative fair summation of your friend in London's view. No, uh, yeah. she's going to be quite mad at this, but I didn't say the name, so it could be any friend. It could be- it's But we like know it's a she. Canada. Uh, well, see, I-, I uh, I'm, You've given that away. Well, that's, with, of course, I would not, um, I made that up completely. It's, it's all, just like my girlfriend in Canada, she's completely a figment of my imagination. But nevertheless, <laughs> Winston Churchill uh, is somebody, I mean, just looking at reading The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich is an incredible figure that, um, that to me, so much of World War II is marked, leading up to the war is marked by stunning amounts of cowardice by political leaders. Yes. And it's fascinating to watch here this person clearly with a drinking and a smoking problem what was, was it? Was I don't understand why that's a negative. No, I didn't say. It. You see, yeah, you thought, throw it in as if it is. No, well, it's it's called humor. I'll explain it to you one day what that means. But yeah, the, uh, he I stood. Explain dry humor. <laughs> <laughs> he stood up. He 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 stood up to what we now see as evil, when at the time it was not so obvious to see. Um, you know, so that that's a, that's a, just a fascinating figure of Western civilization. I'd love to get your well, comments. The real criticisms, I mean, other yeah. than smoking and drinking, the real criticisms of of, of Churchill are qu quite easy to to sum up, and I do so in the War on the West. Actually, I say these are the things that they now use against him. Uh, didn't do enough to avert the Bengal famine in 1943, for instance. That's that's been shot down by numerous historians, including Indian historians. Uh, in the middle of the war, uh, in the middle of a world war, Churchill did what he could to get grain supplies diverted um, from Australia to, in, to, to, to Bengal. Uh, um, the, the famine was appalling. It was caused by a typhoon. It was not caused by Winston Churchill. Um, and the idea that some basically Indian nationalist historians have pumped out in recent years and just anti-Churchill figures that he actually wanted Indians to die is, um, is just a total calumny. 
And when people claim, because some people claim that, I mean, there are a few very ignorant scholars, but nevertheless with some credentials, who claim that Churchill wanted the Indian population to like, basically be genocided. And it's, it's complete nonsense, not least by the fact that during the period which in question the Indian population boomed. Um, so th that, that's one of the main ones. Another one is that he had um, some views that we now would regard as racist. He definitely regarded races as being of different characters um, and that there were superior races and, the, the, as it were, the white European was a superior culture. Um, uh, he was born in Victorian England, so he had some Victorian attitudes. Um these are things in the negative side of the ledger. And as with all history, you should have a negative and a positive side of the ledger. Positive side of the ledger includes he almost certainly did more than any one human being to save the world from Nazism. So that should count as something. And one of the reasons I talk about Churchill in this regard is to, is to stress that if you get, I'm not trying to stop anyone doing history at all. I don't think that the revisionism of recent years about Churchill or the founding fathers of America or anyone else is, Anything I want to stop, I find it interesting. I find it interesting not least because it's so sloppy on occasions, but I find it interesting and it's important. And we should be able to see people in the round. But that includes recognizing the positive side of the ledger. And if you can't recognize that side, you're doing something else. You're doing something else. It's not history. It's um, some form of politicking of a very particular kind and I think it's the same thing with the Founding Fathers. Um, there are some people, for instance, certainly since the 90s, who have pushed the Sally Hemings, Thomas Jefferson story to show that Thomas Jefferson was some kind of brute. As a result, um, you know, we see Jefferson's statue being removed from the council chamber of the city we're sitting in last November by council members who said that Thomas Jefferson no longer represents our values. If you can't, re if you can't recognize greatness of Thomas Jefferson and that he had flaws, I mean, that's not a grown-up debate. And weigh them and weigh them in the context of the time. But let me sort of throw a curveball at you, uh, a curveball at you then. Uh, what about recognizing the positive and the negative of a fellow with nice facial hair called Karl Marx? Sure, sure. So, I mean, I, I, I have a section in the War in the West, as you know, where I go for Karl Marx with some glee. So he seems to have gotten, uh, you know, some popularity in in the West recently. Um, Not just recently, yeah. I mean, he's he's had a resurgence recently. Yes, resurgence recently. Well, that's because that's because whenever whenever things are seen to go wrong, people reach for other options. And when, for instance, it's very hard for people to accumulate capital, it's not obvious that they're going to become capitalists. And so one thing that happens is people say, let's look at the Marxism thing again, see if that's a viable goer. And my argument would simply be, point me to one place that's worked. Well, the argument from the uh, Marxist or the Marxian economists is that We've only really tried it once. The Soviets tried it, and then if there's a few people that kind of tried the Soviet thing, of, Cuba tried it. Well, they they basically it's an offshoot of the sure. of, of they tried Soviet. It, right? Yes, they've tried it. They tried it in Venezuela. Yes, yes, yes. Fair so, enough. but let's but, just let's just quickly say, how did all these experiments go? They they, they did not. Well, they failed in fascinating ways. They did, but they failed. Yes, they failed. And, and we, we should stress. So grossly failed, so, so grossly failed that they threw millions and millions of people into completely thwarted lives that were much shorter than they should have been. Yeah, so the the lesson to learn there, that you can learn several lessons. One is that anything that smells like Marxism is going to lead to a lot of problems. Now, another lesson could be, well, what is the fundamental idea that Marx had, he was criticizing capitalism mm -hmm. and the flaws of capitalism. So is it possible to do better than capitalism? And that's, if you take that spirit, you start to wonder, that might actually become relevant in, I don't know, 20, 30, 50 years, when uh, the qual the um, the machines start doing more and more of the labor, all those kinds of things, you start to ask questions. I finally might get to Marx's dream of what the average day would look like. Yes. 
Well, yeah, uh, well there's going to be an awful lot of literary criticism then. <laughs> if you well, remember, that's what Mark said that we would be doing in the evenings. The labor in the evening. Would well, be. he didn't know Twitter was a thing or Netflix, so he yeah. would he would change. Are there things we could learn from Marx? Pl plausibly, possibly. I can't think of anything myself offhand. But um, to have a critique of capitalism isn't by any means a bad thing in the society. I'd rather that it was a critique of capitalism that showed how you improve capitalism, a, a, a critique of the free market that showed how people could get better, better access to the free market, how you could ensure, for instance, that young people get onto the property ladder, things like that. Those are constructive things. The people who say we, we must have Marxism, I mean, don't know what the hell they're talking about. Right. Because that, that never leads to any of those things. Haven't led in the past. It's never led in the past, and at some point you've got to just you've got to try to work out how many try how many attempts you make at this damn philosophy before you realize that every attempt always leads to the same thing. I mean, say we could pretend that fascism has never been properly tried, and that it was unfortunate what happened in Nazi Germany, but you know that wasn't real fascism, and. In Mussolini's fascism, you know, it didn't go all that well, but it was, you know, a bit better. And maybe we could try a bit more Franco fascism. Nobody would have any t time for this crap, nor should they. The people who try that are, are reviled, and quite rightly. So why do we tolerate it with the Marxism thing? And and it, it's a great mystery to me the way that people do tolerate it. Always, always in this stupid way of saying we haven't done it yet. And if you keep trying the same recipe and every time it comes out as shit, it's that the recipe's shit. Well, sort of, I'm trying to practice here by playing devil's advocate, practice the same idea that you mentioned, which is when you say the word Marxism, should you throw out everything or should you ask a question, is there good ideas here? And the same, it's the good, it's weighing the good and the bad and being able to do so calmly and thoughtfully. Sure. Um, you know, do you know the famous George Orwell uh, comment on the Stalin in an argument with a Stalinist? Mm. Do you know this? No. That's one of my favorite quotes. George Orwell in the, in the early 40s gets into an argument with a, um, a Stalinist who's obviously a Marxist. And the, um, uh, this is after the show trial, it's 37. Uh, this, is, this is when it's very clear what Marxism in the Russian form is. And this, uh, uh, Orwell is in the discussion with this, this this Marxist, and it goes on and on, and eventually, and eventually, Or Orwell says, "Well, you know, what about the show trials, and and he does, and what about what's happened in the Ukraine, and 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 the famines, and and much more, and the purges, and the purges, and the purges, and eventually, the Stalinist says to Orwell what Orwell knows he's going to say all along, which is, he says, you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs." And Orwell says, where's the omelet? Oh, yeah. So, that's a good, that's a really good. Cause so that, it's, look that's at a, this by this stage, okay? How many. Where's my damn omelet? <laughs> where, how many just messy, big, bloody, eggy piles have the Marxists created by now in country after country? Yeah. Always next time they're going to produce the great omelet. But they never have, and they never will, because the whole thing is rotten from the start. But let me just also say one thing about that, because of course Marx isn't as nice as he sounds, and that's one of the things that I, I I try to highlight in the book is if we're going to do this reductive thing of people in history and saying, well, they had views that were of their time, and we must therefore condemn them for them. Say, fine, let's do the same thing with Marx. And there are things I quote in this book from Marx's letters, not least the letters to Engels. And indeed, in his published writings, in part, piece, he was writing for the American press uh, in the 18, uh, 1850s, uh, the way he, he has hor horrible views on slavery and, and, and um, colonialism and much more. But the main thing is, I mean, the horrible things he says about uh, black people and the constant use of the N-word. In fact, when I was doing the audiobook for The War in the West, I had to decide, will I read out the quotes from Marx or not? If I had have read them out, I'd have been cancelled because people would have just said, you've, you've been using the N-word so much in this passage. And, you know, this is, and I slightly thought of doing it so that I could say I was only quoting Marx to try to hit the point home. In the end, of course, I was sensible and decided not to. But Marx's letters are disgusting on, on, on these terms. Since I highlighted this in this book and some of the media picked it up, um, 
and um, and have popularized this thing I'm trying to put into the system, which is if you're going to accuse Churchill of racism, if you're going to choose, accuse Jefferson of racism, Washington of racism, and so on, what about Marx? The two things that Marxists have said since this came out has been, first of all, why are you saying this about Marx? He was a man of his time, like everyone else. And the second thing they say is, we don't go to Marx for his horrible, abhorrent views on race. They're talking about mixed race people as gorillas and so on. We don't go to him for that. We go to him for his economic theories. I say, okay, well, we don't go to Thomas Jefferson for his views on slaves. We don't go to Churchill for his the precise language he used at points in the 1910s about Indians. Or his health advice. Or his health advice. <laughs> I, I do get him for that. but That explains so much. But <laughs> let's have some standards on this. And that's why, I, I'm, that's why I'm very suspicious of the fact that the people don't do this with Marx, because I think what they're trying, what some people are trying to do, and this, isn't, this may sound conspiratorial, but I really don't think it is. I think that some people are deliberately trying to completely clear the cultural landscape of our past in order to say there's nothing good nothing you can hold on to, no one you should revere. You've got no heroes. The whole thing comes down. Who's left standing? Oh, we've also got this idea from the 20th century still about Marxism, or the 19th and 20th centuries. And, and no, no, you, 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 I will not have the entire landscape deracinated and then the worst ideas tried again. So basically destroy all of history and the lessons learned from history and then start from scratch and then then it's completely any idea can work and then you could just take whatever. Well, and, and the thing is there are always some people with pre-prepared ideas. And I mentioned this also with the post-colonialists. The post-colonialists were really interesting because when the European powers were removing, were removing from Africa and the Far East, post-colonial movements had one obvious move they could have done, which was to say, since the European powers have left, we will return to a pre-colonial life, which in some of their places would have been returning to slave markets and slave ownership and slave selling and much more. But put that aside for a second. They could have said we have an indigenous culture which we will return to. Almost uniformly in the post-colonial era, you had figures like Franz Fanon, you had European intellectuals like Sartre, who said the Western powers are retreating from these countries and therefore we should institute in these countries what but Western Marxism. Well, it's not obvious to me that like the bad ideas will be the ones that emerge, but it's more likely that the bad ideas would emerge in this kind of context when you erase history, when you erase tradition. When you erase history and you leave some ideas deliberately uninterrogated. Sure. I mean, as I say, find me one in a hundred American students who've heard of and any of the communist despots of the 20th century. I mean, name recognition in, there was a poll done a few years ago in the, in the UK, and like name recognition among children, school children for Stalin, let alone Mao. I mean, Mao, who kills more people than anyone. 65 million Chinese, perhaps. How many students in America know what Mao was, who he was, where he was? Nothing. Or, or the atrocities committed. Where the atrocities were committed. Or, and I worry about that because it's, it means that we might have learned one of the two lessons of the 20th century. We, we think we've learned one of the, le of, of the two lessons of the 20th century. We actually haven't learned that lesson. We've learned a little bit of it. And we've not learned the other one at all, because that's why we still have people in American politics and elsewhere actually talking about collectivization and things as if there's no problem with that and as if it's perfectly obvious and they could run it and they'd know exactly where to start. What are the two lessons of the 20th century? Fascism and communism. Oh. Yeah. I mean, I'm not exactly sure what the exactly the lessons are. No, it's not clear. The le but, if the lessons were very clear, we'd be better at it. Well, one is your book broadly applied of the madness of crowds. That's one lesson. Well, no, well how so? <laughs> Meaning like um, large crowds can display oh. herd-like behavior. Yes, be very suspicious of crowds. Yeah, in general, I mean, you apply it in different, more to modern application yeah. in a sense, but it's, 
that that's rooted in history that crowds can when when humans get together they can do some uh quite radically silly things elias canetti is very good on that crowds and power um and eric hoffer who is a sort of self-taught amazing um not the autodidactic writer the true believer and so on he, he was extremely good on that but the, the reason I mentioned the two things, no, I mean, we should have realized that the two nightmares of the 20th century, fascism and communism, that we, sh we should know how they came about. And we're interested in learning how one of them came about, fascism. And we know some of the lessons, like don't treat other people as less than you because of their race. Like, that's one lesson. But um, and we've, we've done some good at learning that. Um, but the second one, not to do communism again, not to do socialism. Uh, I, I think we're way away from knowing because we don't know how it happened, and the and the little temptations are still there always. Look at people saying, "I'm going to expropriate your property." If people do things they don't like, they will get. We can't wait to take your property. Well, there's a sense. There's an appealing sense. Okay, every ideology has an appealing narrative behind it that, that sells the ideology. So for socialism, for communism is that there's a, it seems unfair that the working class does all of this work and gets only a fraction mm. of the output. It just seems unfair. So you want to make- If they do it, get a fraction of the output, yes. Yes. And so it seems to be more fair if we increase that. If the workers own um, all all of the value of their output, and well, things that are more fair seems to be a good thing. I'd say, well, yeah. I, I mean, fairness is is. Uh, I like fairness as like a justice. term. <laughs> no, I much prefer fairness because it's a much easier thing to try to work out. It's quite amorphous itself as a concept, but everyone can recognize it. So, for instance. Um. Should the boss of the company earn a million times that of the lowest paid employee? It doesn't seem fair. Should they earn maybe five or ten times the the salary of the lowest employee? Yeah, possibly. That that could be fair. There are certain sort of multiples which are within the bounds of you know reasonableness. I, I think actually that's the that's the much bigger problem in, in, in capitalism at the moment, as I see it, is is the is the not untrue perception that a tiny number of people get a lot of the accrue a lot of the benefits, and that the the the, the bit in the middle has become increasingly squeezed and is at danger always of falling all the way down to the bottom. I mean, I think in the snakes and ladders of American capitalism, for instance, it's. it's it's a correct perception to say that the snakes go down awfully far. If you tread on the snake, you can plummet an awfully long way in America. And the deal in the game was that the ladders took you high. And there's a perception, and again, it's not entirely wrong, that the ladders system on the board is kind of broken. So That's what you're saying is you're a Marxist. I'm not Douglas saying Murray. I'm a Marxist. You heard that here first in the uh, in in the out of context blog post get, you're going to write about this. <laughs> I get to, I get back to this point. The way to critique capitalism, if it's gone bad, is to get better capitalism. Yes. Free markets where they're not fair should be made fair. Never decide that the answer is the thing that has never produced any human flourishing, i.e., Marxism. So as you describe in the madness of crowds, the herd-like behavior of humans that gets us into trouble, uh, you as an individual thinker and others listening to this, how can you, because all of us are amidst crowds, we're influenced by the society that's around us, by the people that's around us, how can we think independently? How can we, you know, if you're in, um, in the, in the Soviet Union at the beginning of the 20th century, if you're in, I don't know, Nazi Germany at the end of the 30s and 40s, how can you think independently? Um, given, first of all, 
that it's hard to think independently, just intellectually speaking, but also that there's is is just becomes more and more dangerous. So the incentive to think independently under the uncertainty uh, that's usually involved with thinking is, it, it, I mean, it's a silly thing to say, but on Twitter there's a cost to be paid for yes for going against the crowd on any silly thing. Well, we can even talk about, you know, uh, what is it? Will Smith slapping mm -hmm. Chris Rock. You know, there's a crowd that believes that uh, that was unjustified or something. I forget what, what the crowd decided, but I don't- Crowd you, split on that one. It's safe to have one opinion either way. Okay, it is, right. But there is this, you, you put it very nicely, that there's clearly a calculus here and that you can measure on Twitter in particular, you can measure kind of the crowd, mm. a sense of where the crowd lays. Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. Well, oh boy, I don't want to. Uh, this is not. This is not a legal sure. discussion. Where I have lawyer. I don't have my lawyer Just, present. Yeah. I don't even have a lawyer. The man in question is dead. But I think most people who are not just diehard fans would concede that Michael Jackson had a strange relationship with children, yes. and uh, was almost certainly a pedophile. Is that, was that, did, did the crowd agree on that? Uh, no, the crowd hasn't agreed because he's too famous and we all love Thriller. Yeah, we do. So you said people who are not fans, I just don't. No, Michael I'm Jackson. a fan of Michael Jackson, yeah, but yeah. I think he was almost certainly a pedophile. And, uh, but, I, but nobody wants to give up dancing to bad at weddings. So uh, they just kind of add it in, it's fine. Seriously, it's-, it's But it's see, a, your, your law a does not apply to uh, Bill Cosby. Oh, that's so it. well. He wasn't. A, he 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 was, of course, one of the most famous people in America. Yeah. But maybe he wasn't regarded as talented. Oh, so, oh, wow. There's there's depth to this. Oh, calculation. Yeah. There's a genius opt out in all cultures. Hmm. There's a genius opt out in all cultures. Look at Lord Byron. Lord Byron shagged his sister. Doesn't affect his reputation. In fact, if anything, it kind of adds to it. But then again, this kind of war against the West, genius is actually makes you more likely or no, to get canceled. So if you look at the genius of Thomas Jefferson or- Well, yes, because if you haven't done anything remarkable, nobody will come looking for you possibly. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so Sidle, genius can get you in trouble through eventually. Life. Okay. Sidle through life with nobody noticing, be totally harmless and then and then die and hope you haven't used any carbon. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but you were asking about, you were asking about how to survive the the era of social media as it were and the yeah. crowds yeah. and and there's a very simple answer to that D don't um don't overrate the significance of the unreal world oh come on but this is still human psychology because you want to fit in there's a you want to why because you're you like people and you this is a why not just like a small number of people and ignore the rest yeah that's that's what i do well, I, I mean, I, I actually I, like most people. I'm not, this isn't a general thing. Yeah. I don't have detestation for most people at all. Uh, most people I come across, I enjoy speaking with and being with. Mm -hmm. But um, in terms of storing your sense of self worth in absolute strangers, big mistake. Yeah. Well, me, that's this is not, this turned into a therapy session because for me, and I think I represent some number of population. Is I'm pretty self critical. I'm looking for myself in the world, and uh, there is a depth of connection with people on the internet. I mean, I, I mean, have I think some- there's a shallowness of it. It's shallow connection. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I Put it this way, if you um, if you became very ill tomorrow, would any of them help? On the internet? No. 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 Good. That's a good test. Yeah, that's a good test. But then at the end of the day, yeah, you're right. Your very close friends would help, family would help. Yeah. Yep. And perhaps that's the only thing- You can't store, you can't store, um, significant amounts of, of trust or faith or belief or self-worth in places which will not return it to you. Okay, so let's talk about the more extreme case, the harsher case. When you talk about the things you talk about in the war uh, on the West and madness of crowds, I mean, you're getting a lot of blowback, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> as uh, for the listener, you just, shrugged lightly with a zen-like look on your face. Um, so you don't, all you need is Sam Harris to say that you're brilliant and you're happy. <laughs> <laughs> no, no it's, I'm, I'm very, I love Sam. Yeah. Um, I'm deeply pleased when he flatters me, but I yeah. mean, I'm, 
and is nice about me, but no, I don't just rely on that. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I don't. I, why would I mind if, I, apart from, it, I mean, maybe it's self-selecting. If I didn't have the view I had about that, or the whatever armory it is that I have on that, I wouldn't do what I did. Maybe. I mean, have you been to some dark places psychologically because of the challenging ideas you explore? So, like significant self doubt, just kind of. Uh, um, I can't say I've been unaffected by by everything in my life by any means. That would make me a, an automaton of some kind. Um, there's definitely times I've got things wrong and regretted that. Uh, there's times I've. Uh, there have there was a period around the time I wrote uh, my book, "The Strange Death of Europe," which. Uh, it was a very, very dark time. And it wasn't because I was having a dark time in my life, but because of the book I was writing. Oh, because of the place you had to go mm. in order to write yeah. the book. And, um, well, I was contemplating the end of a civilization. So, so occasionally now, I have a, maybe slightly too pat at this stage, but sometimes readers come up to me in the street or whatever and say, you know, I love the, the strange death of Europe. And will say, you know, it's a very depressing book to read, however. And I would say, well, you should have tried writing it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it, it was because, I mean, I was, it was, it's, it, it has chunks of it, which I'm very proud of in particular about um, uh, the death of religion, the death of God, the, the, the loss of meaning and um, the, the void. And uh, that's difficult stuff to write about and, and to grapple with. And there is a sort of, I haven't reread that book um, since it came out, but um, I think there are passages in it which reveal what I was thinking very clearly in the poetry of it, as it were, as well as the the detail. Um, but yeah, I, I, I can't say, I'm used, I, I'm used to, to saying what I think and what I see and if there's any pushback I've got from that, I'm completely consoled that I'm saying what I see with my own eyes. That's your source of strength, is that you're always seeking the truth as best you see it. Well, I can't agree to go along with a lie if I've seen something with my own eyes. Do you ever, so speaking of Sam Harris, uh, and I mentioned to you offline, a lot of people, I talk to a lot of smart people my private life on this podcast, and a lot of them will reference you as a as their example of a very smart person. So, given that, a compliment. Um, do you ever worry that your sort of ego grows to a level where you're not what you think is the truth is no longer the truth? Is this kind of um, it blinds you? And also, on top of that, the fact that you stand against the crowd often, mm. that there's part of it that appeals to you, that you like to point out the emperor has no clothes. I get a certain thrill from the friction. Yeah, that sometimes both your ego and the thrill of friction will get you to uh, deviate from the truth and instead just look for the friction. Could do, could do for sure. Um, I try to keep alive to that. I mean, I try. I mean, early in my career, I realized that, for instance, I didn't want to f to make un enemies unnecessarily, <laughs> any more than strictly necessary, because there was a very large number of already necessary enemies. And I remember once I won't go into the details, but I, I already had one sort of thing I'd done that we, and then another thing came out. And I just thought I can't, I can't do that. Um, and I and I remember thinking, don't be the sort of person who's forever creating storms and I tried to make sure I wasn't and I think I've pretty much stuck to that but to answer your question um, well the first thing is I'm f I'm uh, as confident as I can be that um, I wouldn't fall into the trap you described for two reasons I mean one is that I don't think of myself as a wildly intelligent person um, partly because I'm very very aware of the things I know nothing about I mean, for instance, I have a, almost no knowledge of the details of finance uh, or economic theory. 
um i mean the the real details i don't mean the, the big picture of the kind that we were just discussing earlier but uh i have if you put the um periodic table in front of me i would struggle to do more than um a handful <laughs> yeah um i am very conscious of huge gaps in my knowledge and, and where i have gaps or chasms i tend to find i have a disproportionate admiration for the people who know that stuff mm. like i'm wildly impressed by people who understand money really understand it you mm. know they think how the hell do you do that um uh and the same thing with biologists medics stuff i just know very little about and that's a source of humility for you, just knowing that. Yes, I mean, I think, well, I, I'm okay on that stuff, but I'm mean, like, oh, Jesus, if you got me under general knowledge, I would say that thing, uh, some years ago, there's a, there's a thing in, in the UK called University Challenge, I don't know if it's, um, and I, my, uh, I was asked some years ago on to, uh, there's a sort of like celebrity one of former students of the universities or colleges asked to go back for like the Christmas special. And, um, and I was asked to be one of the people from my old college to go back and compete in the sort of celebrity alumni one. Mm -hmm. And the only reason I actually wanted to do it was because I discovered that Louis Theroux had been to my college before my time and he was on, he'd agreed to be on the team. And I thought, well, I'd love to meet Louis Theroux. That'd be great fun. And uh, anyhow, and I said, well, I really don't want to do it. And they said, come on, you'd be great. I said, I wouldn't. I'd show myself up to be a total asshole and ignoramus. And uh, as it was, I sat down my flat and I watched some past episodes of University Challenge. <laughs> and I realized I'd have just sat mute for the whole half hour. Um, I just could not. The first question was about physics and the second one was about, uh, as it was, I watched the the one, and I could answer the first two or three questions uh, of the one that actually went out because they they made it a bit simpler. Um, <laughs> but but I mean, I'm terribly conscious of the. Of, and I said to the producers, I said I can't go on because I mean, I just couldn't answer the questions. These unbelievably smart students seem to be able to answer on a whole range of things. So I'm perfectly aware of my limitations, and um, you you contemplate your limitations. Too. Yeah, and they're forever before me. You know. No, they're not hard to find in an average day. And and then on top of that, I suppose it's um you in a way, you know that line from Rudyard Kipling's um alternately brilliant and slightly nauseating poem If. There's a li there's a line You just enjoy a good poem, can you? Well, no, it's it's, 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 it's not it's not I can it, enjoy a great poem. Yes. But I mean a good poem. Yes. This is you know, slightly off. Well, Wait, this is this is this goes to your criticism of Dostoevsky. Yeah. Take 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 uh, Douglas's criticism with a grain of salt. So uh, maybe I've heard it, read it too many memorial services and things. Sure, but uh, that line of it's a good piece of advice. If you can learn to meet triumph and disaster and meet these greet these two imposters just the same. Yeah, that's a good line. It's a good line, as, as, as Kipling often done, an amazing turn of line. But I, I do think that it's a very sensible thing to try to greet uh, um, triumph and disaster and regard them as imposters and greet them just the same. And actually, anyone who knows me knows that I never, partly it's because I have a sort of belief in the old gods, and that the moment that I thought that I was at the moment of triumph, the fates would hitch up their skirts and run at me at a million miles an hour. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also because I gen anyone who knows me knows I never have a moment when I say, um, that's just great. I feel totally fulfilled and victorious. I mean, it happened to me recently when, my, when the War in the West went straight in at number one in the bestseller list. How long did that last in terms of your self-satisfaction? Didn't happen. Not even for a brief moment? No. Hmm. When I first saw that it was selling, I had that moment of elation. I thought, good, I've done it, it's out. And I did have a moment of elation then, definitely. But it doesn't last, partly because I tell myself it mustn't last. Because, as you said, fate hitches up its skirt. Is that yeah. is that skirts? I don't. This you you Brits with your with your poetry, even when it's nauseating. <laughs> as of twenty twenty two, this year, 
What's your final analysis of the political leadership and the human mind and the human being of Donald Trump? <laughs> I sort of avoided this for years. Just talking about Trump. I tried to avoid talking about Trump for years. It's the same reason I tried to avoid writing about Brexit. Do you think that Trump, just sorry on a small tangent, do you think the Trump story is uh, over or are we just done with volume one? I have no idea. The people I know who know him say that he's running. Um, and uh, and I think that in, in general, Republicans have to do have a choice in front of them. Uh, and one friend put it to me recently said, you've got to go in with your toughest fighter. <laughs> and uh, I understand that instinct. And I also think it's a very dangerous instinct because what if your toughest fighter is also your biggest liability? Um, what's the best way to get out the Democrat vote in 2024 than to have Donald Trump running? And the people that are doing the war in the West are pretty tough fighters. Uh, they are. And um, I'm cautious about this because I know every way I tread is dangerous. But let me just, uh, just be Tread frank. gracefully. I'll tread as gracefully as I can. I was in my Wellington boots. I, in my galoshes. Uh, I, yeah. here's, here's the thing. <laughs> uh, I, th I think everybody knows what Trump is. I think we all knew for years. And I feel sorry for the conservatives who had to pretend that he was something he wasn't. I felt sorry for the ones who had to pretend that, for instance, he was a, some devout Christian or a man of faith or a man of great integrity or uh, all of these sorts of things. Because I mean, in the public eye for years, it had been obvious that wasn't the case. But he, but he has something extraordinary. What, one thing is a method of communication that you've just got to say is, was unbelievable. In, I mean, a, in one fundamental way that you can't look away for some reason. Can't look away. I mean, we, I, I mean, watching him clear everyone out of the way in 2016 was thrilling because those people needed clearing away. You know, I mean, it's just horrified. What, America's going to give us another Bush? What's so great about this family? Um, America's going to give us another Clinton. We're going to get to choose between Clinton and the Bush. Mark Stein said, whatever, we'll just wait for the day the Clintons and the Bushes intermarry and then we can really have a monarchy again. Um, so, I, I I was very pleased to see him clear them away. I was very clear to him, pleased to see him sort of raise some of the issues that needed raising. I thought it was a sort of breath of fresh air, and I wished it wasn't him doing it. Um, and then there was the question of him governing, and it was just perfectly clear he didn't know how to govern. He What he did have, however, what he does have, is an incredible ability to fight. And some of the forces he was arraigned against were arraigned against him. My gosh, they would have taken down anyone else. I mean, if they'd have probably done some similar BS against Ted Cruz, if he, you know, or Marco Rubio, you know, they'd have said, as some of the, some people have admitted, they'd have they'd have accused all these people of racism and misogyny and everything else as well, just like they did Mitt Romney, just like they did John McCain. Um, but. Trump was the one ugly enough and bruisy enough to fight. And also a willingness or a lack of willingness to play sort of the civil yes. game of politics, sort of, yeah. you know, at a party when um, like politeness gets you in trouble. Yeah, I you mean. You show up and everybody's polite and you just out of momentum want to be, be being polite and all of a sudden you're on an island with Jeffrey Epstein and uh, <laughs> it gets you into a huge yeah. amount of trouble. But so, so Trump has these sort of extraordinary qualities, but I just, you know, look, he he, he screwed up uh, during his time in office because he didn't achieve as much as he should have done. Now you could say that about every president, but I refuse to acknowledge that two years when he had both houses in the first, the beginning, he just didn't know what levers to pull. You know, I mean, he was sitting in the, the office behind the Oval Office tweeting, watching the news. I'm sorry, that's not a president. And um, he couldn't fill and didn't fill positions because people knew, I mean, people who were very loyal to him, he would just, you know, he'd get them to do something loyal and then destroy them. Yeah. And I, I think, and then we get onto the thing about, and, and here we get onto the, you know, what of course is very, very fractious terrain, but 
you know, I covered the 2020 election and I was traveling all around the states and I went to Trump rally and and all sorts of stuff. And I, I mean, I was I was in D.C. on election night and um, when and it got very ugly at one point um, in so-called Black Lives Matter Plaza when it looked like Trump might win when Florida came in. It got really, I could feel the air well, very, very heated and like some Antifa people started getting into black lock and this sort of stuff. And I thought, this town's going to burn, you know, if, if Trump wins. And in the aftermath of the vote, I was willing to hang around in Washington for a bit and then I saw it was going to drag on. And I saw some of his people and others and people told me they had great evidence of vote rigging and all this sort of thing. And I'm afraid I'm one of those people who doesn't believe that the evidence that they've presented is good enough to justify the claim that he won the election. And I, and people say, have you seen 2,000 mules? And have you seen, yeah. this? look, the evidence isn't there that the, that the election was won by Donald Trump. Yeah. And I think that what he did on January the 6th was unbelievably dangerous. And, you know, here it is possible for us to hold two ideas in our head at the same time. January the 6th was not nothing, nor was it an insurrection and an attempt to stage a coup. And uh, there's a vanishing number of people in the US, or as Eric Weinstein said, like the, the, it's like, this is the, the, the roof that you have to walk along. And mm -hmm. like the, the sides are very steep yeah. if you fall off either side. Is there some sense, given the forces that are waging war in the West, you said this feeling, perhaps because of Antifa or something else, that this town is gonna burn, mm. and maybe a continued feeling that this town is going to burn with the January 6th events. Mm. Are you worried about the future of the United States oh, in the sure. coming years? because of the, 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 there's a feeling of escalation. Sure. Is that just a war of Twitter or is there- no, it's a, real. Is there a real brewing of something? Oh, it's real. And how, well, let me then respond to that. How, what is the hopeful? If you, if you 10 years from now look back at the United States and say, we turned it around, hmm. What would be the reason? What would be the ways, the mechanisms that we do so? I'll tell you, um, since I since I wrote this book, uh, there are two things in particular that I've been really pleased that a specific type of specialist has approached me on to say that things I've written about actually have more application than I realized. Mm -hmm. One is um, the gratitude issue. A number of people have approached me who have gone through AA um, or Alcoholics Anonymous. They sometimes say, have you ever been to AA? And I, that's a bit personal question. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> but they say, but the reason they ask it is because they say, well, because if you go to drug rehabilitation or, or alcohol anonymous, um, uh, <laughs> Norm MacDonald said, it doesn't sound very anonymous. You stand up in a room, you say your name and you tell everyone the worst things you've ever done. So it sounds the opposite of anonymous. Anyhow, but they say, uh, look, because if you go to these things, apparently you're asked Two, um, as part of your recovery, yeah. say what you're grateful for, like list what you're grateful for. I didn't know that, by the way, until until, uh, until the book was out. And, and so it turned out to have more application than I knew. The other thing, though, is that I say that it's absolutely crucial in America that we try to find things that we agree on. And a couple of times since the book came out, I've been approached by people who are marriage counselors. Um, but we've also said, I mean, have you ever been through marriage counseling? Like, again, that's a very personal question. <laughs> Stop asking me personal <laughs> questions. Um, no, but they, and, they, and I said, well, why? They, well, because this is, this is one of the things that we do in couples therapy is try to find things you agree on. And I think this is very important in America. And it's made much harder by the fact, and I've said this many times, but forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but it's made much harder by the fact that having different opinions is very last century. Now we all have different facts, or at least the two sides have different facts. One half of the country roughly, or let's say 40%, 30%, whatever you want to put it, with a you know tired minority in the middle, um, one segment of the country believes that Hillary Clinton won the 2016 election and that the Russians interfered and got Donald Trump into power. 
Another half of the country believes that Donald Trump won the 2020 election. If you can't agree on who wins elections, it's very hard to see who you, what you agree on as a country. That's one of the th reasons I mind the war on American history and Western history is one of the things you have to agree on is at least some attitude towards your past. You don't have to agree on everything. But like, the public square has to have public heroes who are agreed to be heroes to some extent, warts and all. Um, if you don't have that, if actually you think, for instance, like, half the country thinks the founding fathers were pretty good, the other half thinks they were absolutely rotten racists and so on. If half the country basically thinks it would have been be better if Columbus had taken a different turn, never found America, gone back home and said, I don't know, nothing out there, that would have been better. And the other half's pretty glad in the, in the end that we've got America. Um, you know, you, you've got to agree on something. And I just see in America, so I do think we've got to try to find things to agree on, like a reasonable attitude towards the past. That's why that matters. I, and again, I stress, I'm not trying to say that everything in the American past was good. God knows that wouldn't stand up to a second scrutiny or self-scrutiny. But nor was it all bad. This wasn't a country formed in sin and in an eradicable sin. It wasn't founded in 1619 in order to make the country wicked and incapable of es escaping that wickedness. You know, these are things that will matter enormously in the years ahead, because if you can't agree on anything, including who your heroes are, like the whole thing is just one massive division, and we'll see what I think we're already seeing, which is people basically going to states where it's more like the life they want to live. And some people say to me, well, that's okay, and the genius of the founding is that it allows for that. That's possible, but it's also, it eradicates part of what has been American public life, which is the ability to look at each other and discuss face to face. And I see things like this bomb placed under America the other week with the Supreme Court League, the draft league, as being just a further example of that. I'm very, very worried about it in America. And, and because if America screws up everything, everything else in the world goes. Yeah, there is the degree to which America is still the beacon just, of these ideas on, on which the co the country was founded and has been able to live out in better and better forms, sort of live out the actual ideals of the founding principles yeah. versus and like- with, And with the desire to improve. Yeah, constant. An imperfect union. Yeah, well, so I generally have hope that people want to sort of, in terms of gratitude, people are, are aware of how good it feels to be grateful. Um, that it's, just, it's a better life psychologically. The resentment is a thing that destroys you from within. So I just feel that people will um, long for that and will find that. And that's the, the, that's the American way. Some of the division that we reveal now has to do with new technologies like social media yes. that, that kind of is, is a small kind of deviation from the path we're on because it's a new, we got a new toy, but just we, like nuclear exactly. weapons. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is relatively new. Yeah. Um, but we need to find reasonable attitudes towards these things. And I, that's why I say like, it matters how you and my feedback on social media, mm -hmm. because we might, we're all going through it to some extent. Yeah, we're learning. And we're learning, and we've got to learn how to do this without going mad. You know, I say this, that was my, my minimalist, call to friends in this era was the main job is not to go insane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, like walk towards sanity. Uh, Cause you know, I'm sure there's a Hunter S. Thompson quote in there. I'm like the insanity on the weekends can be at least fun. Okay. Do you have advice for young people uh, that just put down their TikTok and uh, are listening to this podcast in high school and college about how to have a career, how to have a life they can be proud of? It's a very broad question, but uh, of course, it, I mean, I can give specific advice for people who want to be writers and so on, but that's a bit niche maybe. Um, the well, writers will be very interesting, sorry to interrupt. Also, how to put your ideas down on paper and think oh, that yeah. the ideas develop them and have the guts to to go to a large audience, well, the especially main, when the ideas are sort of controversial or dangerous or difficult. Well, the main thing to do is to read. When I was a schoolboy, I'd ever have a book in my pocket. Um, 
side pocket of my jacket or in his side pocket and would read. And um, that wasn't just because I was swattish in some way, but because I discovered, probably at some point in my early teens, I discovered something. I wrote about this once. I discovered that books were dangerous, which was a thrilling discovery. Yeah. Um, I discovered that they could contain anything. And also people didn't know what you were reading. I remember I got far too young an age, I read The Doors of Perception of Aldous Huxley. Um, and um, I, I, I didn't make head or tail of it probably, <laughs> but I knew that it was about something really interesting and dangerous. Uh, and I thought, constantly when I read poetry or read history, and I was just constantly um, thrilled and wanted to know more. And and if you want to become a writer, you, you have to be a reader. Um, you have to read the best stuff. Um, and, and, you know, obviously people disagree or agree on what that is, and you'll find the people that really impress you. But I know that I just came across certain writers who just knocked me off my feet. Um, and when you find those people, like read everything and cling on to them and find other people like that, find other writers like that or people who are connected by history or scholarship or circles or whatever. For you, was it fiction or nonfiction? Is there particular books that you just remember? Or just give you pause? Well, I remember that the first book that absolutely threw me was The Lord of the Flies mm. of William Golding, which used to be a signed text and everyone's a bit snotty about because it's so popular. Um, but I was thrown because I think it was the first adult book I read in that I had been used to the world of children's literature, of everything ends up fine in the end, the lost all get found. You know, and this was the first book I'd read where that's not the case, where the world turns out differently. And, and I remember for days afterwards, I was just in a state of shock. I, I couldn't believe what I'd just discovered. And partly because I sort of intuited it must be true. Mm -hmm. And of course, that is not to say that the Lord of the Fly, there's lots of scholarship on what children do in the situation of being on the island and when they do congregate and anyhow. But yes, that was a sort of introduction to the adult world and it was shocking and thrilling and um, and I wanted more of it. Um, it was dangerous. And it was dangerous. And then of course, when I became interested in sex, let alone when I realized I was gay, uh, I realized books were a very, very good way to learn about what I was. And that was even more dangerous in a way. And I thought, I mean, nobody knows what I know. And this you, book, you discovered sex? That was an invention in books? You what do you mean? No, nobody what I mean what is, I nobody, no, 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 no. What I mean is that, is that one of the things that gay people have when they're growing up is that you have this terribly big secret and you don't think the world will ever know. You hope the world will never know. And um, the, it's been called by one psychologist, the little boy with a big secret. And... Um, so if you discover that other people have the same secret, there's a sort of, thank God for that. Um, but I mean, that's just a version of what everybody gets in reading in a way, which is the thrill of discovery that um, somebody else thought something you thought only you'd thought. I mean, one of the greatest, one of the greatest thrills in all of literature is when a voice comes from across the centuries and seems to leave a handprint, you know. It makes you feel a little bit less alone because somebody else feels, yes. sees the world the same way, is the same way. That's what C.S. Lewis says, it says, is said to have said, we, we read to know we're not alone. Um, but we don't only read to know we're not alone, we read to become other people. Um, I mean, I think I saw in books a version of the life I wanted to live and then I decided to live it. And for, I'm fortunate enough to have done so. Um, I wanted to live in the world of ideas and um, books and debate, and um, I wanted to live in the debates of my time, you know. And I remember, I remember when, um, like a lot of people, I read Auden when I was young, and uh, you know, certain lines obviously stuck with me. But I, I, that poem of his, which everybody you know knows and which he hated, uh, September the first, nineteen thirty-nine, 
I remember certain lines in that just like whacked me. Um, what's that one? You know, sitting on a dive and for a second street, degrading the loan of the. At the end of a low, dishonest decade. And of course, there's a problem with that line, which is you kind of want to be living at the end of a low, dishonest decade as well. It sounds sort of cool in a way. Like, you know, you're the only person who sees it. But um, so, yeah, anyhow, that's a diversion. But the point is, if you want to be a writer, you've got to be a reader. And apart from anything else, you discover the the lilt of language and the the, the things you can do. And I, I've read people who... And I still do. I think, my God, I didn't. How, how did you do that? In fact, books books for me now and articles and other things fall into two categories. One is I know how you did that. Uh, and the other is I don't know how you did that. And the, and the best feeling as a writer is when you do the second one. And I've and it happens occasionally in my writing life. Well, you almost like return to something you've written, or like right after you. No, write, the moment you write it, you wonder how did I do that? Yes, <laughs> that's that's the most. I've never said that before. That's the happiest thing in writing. Yeah, very occasionally this yeah. sounds, but I mean, I've occasionally finished something. Funny enough, it happened some years ago in a long piece I wrote about the artist Basquiat. Um. Uh. I finished the piece and I gasped. Yeah. I didn't know because because that's also a thing with writing is you 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 it's not sometimes people say you need to write in order to know what you think that's not quite true. Mm. Sometimes you that's a very bad piece of advice for some writers who don't know what they think and it's not going to become clearer if they just start typing. <laughs> <laughs> Fair but enough. yeah. Sometimes it is true that you there's a thought that's just waiting there and a clarity that comes across and suddenly the sentence emerges in your brain. And by the time you've typed it, you you just go, yes. <laughs> that, that's the greatest feeling as a writer. Almost like it came from somewhere else. That's, that's what um, uh, um, Bakunin uh, says about, you know, what's the moment, it's Tom Stoppard's favorite quote about, you know, Bakunin saying what happens in the moment where the, write, where the writer's pen when he pauses. Where does he go in that moment? Um, yeah, hmm. that's so interesting. That's that's so because I think the answer to that question will help us explain consciousness and all those other hmm. weird things about the human mind. Yeah. So that was advice for writers. I didn't really yes. give any advice for people in general, but um, is that? Oh, you want to give health advice? No. To your channel uh, Churchill and no, I don't want to give health advice. Clearly. Because you implied that Churchill was one of your early guides in that aspect. So when you discovered your sexuality, let me ask about love. Mm. Um, too pers far too personal of a question to ask a, a Brit, but um, what was that like? And broadly speaking, what's the role of love in the human condition? Sex and love, and for you personally, discovering that you were, and maybe telling the world that you were mm. gay. I'm on very perilously personal. I, I do actually have a sort of rule that I don't talk about my personal life, but I'll-, I'll Rules are meant to be broken. Okay, well, I'll break it a little bit. Um, okay. the, uh, the, the one of the ways in which growing up and realizing you're gay differs from growing up and being straight is that it's almost inevitable that your first passions will be unrequited. Oh, wow, I never thought about that, yeah. Now, that's not to say, I mean, you know, there's plenty of unrequited love among young men for young women, young women for young men, there's plenty of, yeah. you know, that. But it's almost inevitable if you're gay that your first, uh, you know, passions will be totally unrequited because the odds are that the person in question will not be gay. So the experience of love is mostly heartbreak. It's heartbreak. And disappointment. Yeah, that heartbreak can be beautiful too. Uh, of Formative. Course. Well, it, as again, it comes back to the thing of if you're a writer or something, because you can always do something with it. That's why all writers are sort of not to be trusted. Yeah, I, I, I didn't trust you the moment you walked in here. <laughs> <laughs> fair, no, fair I mean, it, it's, it's a famous problem with writers because you always think, well, I could use that. Uh, it's dangerous. It's a dangerous thing, and all writers it's should. It's almost be aware like a drug, it. right? Uh, no, it's it's not like a drug. It's it's uh, the fear that all 
things, even the greatest suffering, um, it could be material. What's the, what's the danger in that exactly? That seeing the material you in the human experience, uh, you don't experience it fully? You don't you, experience it fully and you might be using it. I had a friend who wrote a poem about a friend who died in a motorcycle accident in Sydney in the 60s. And he said he knew that the moment he was told about his friend's death, a tiny bit of him thought I could use this for a poem. And he did, and the poem was wonderful. But there's always that slight guilt for writers of, am I going to use that? Anyhow, that's a divergence. There's a, life is full of guilty pleasures, and I think that's one of them. Because if you feel that guilt, really, what you're doing is you're capturing that moment, and you're going to impact the lives of many, many people by writing about that moment, because it's going to stimulate something that resonates with those people, because they had similar kinds of memories about a, a yes. loss and a passion towards somebody that they had to lose. So, don't you know? Yes, get, but get there is a good sign, perhaps. A more obvious, perhaps, problem is um, reporting from war zones or bad places and wanting to find bad stories because it's useful. And there, there's, there is a definite guilt you get from that sort of thing. Like the worse the situation, the more useful. And, Anyhow, um, no, so that's that's sort of the only difference that happens from growing up being gay. And it means that most, certainly in my generation, most gay men came to sexual or romantic maturity later. And there's lots of explanations of that um, maybe being one of the reasons for perceived or otherwise promiscuity among gay men, which is, I think, more easily persuaded by the fact that gay men behave like Men would if women were men. <laughs> that's that's one explanation, but it, it, it it's both a feature and a bug that you come to uh, sexual flourishing later in life. Mm -hmm. That could be seen as a yeah in, in, in the trajectory of human life that could be a positive or a negative. Yeah, but what's broadly speaking is the role of love in the human condition, Douglas? Well, it's the nearest thing we have to finding the point. What what is the point? What's what's the meaning of life? Let's go there. So what's the meaning is a hard one, of course. Where is the meaning is slightly easier. Um, and I'd say that everyone can find that. Um, you gravitate towards the places you find meaning. Now there's a conservative answer to this, which is quite useful, and it's certainly more useful than any others, because the conservative answer is find meaning where people have found it before. Which <laughs> is a very, good. very good answer. Yeah. If if your ancestors have found meaning in a place of worship or a particular canon of work, go there because it's been proven by time to be able to give you the goods. Um, uh, much more sensible than saying, hey, I don't know, discover new ways of meaning. Um, uh, but love is... Um, Love is probably the nearest thing we can have to the divine um, on earth. And of course, the problem of what exactly, what type of love we mean is a is an issue. Well, that goes to the fact that you don't like uh, definitions anyway. I do like definitions, I just they, they need to be pinned down. Um, but I, let's, not, let's not go there at the, the moment because it's, yeah. That's not pinned down love at the moment? Well, no, because as you know, I mean, because of the different varieties of love and the fact that we have one word for it in our culture and that it means an awful lot of things and we don't delineate it yeah. well. But let's say human love with, with the greatest fulfillment in um, uh, sexual, fulfillment in sexual love with another person is um, probably the greatest intimation you can have of what um, might otherwise only be superseded by divine love. Um, and it's the um, the sense that all young lovers have, which is that they've just walked through the low door in the garden and found themselves in bliss. And that this is... There's a beautiful, beautiful poem of... Can I read it to you? Yes, please. Um, I'll try to find it. There's a beautiful poem of Philip Larkin's, which slightly says what I'm, 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 I'm trying not to duck your question by referring to other people, but. Maybe that's the best way to answer the question. Could be. Is to read 
read, read, read a poem. So there's a poem by um, Philip Larkin uh, called High Windows, which is um, uh, which is remarkable because he he um, came to sexual. He was straight, but he, he he had a rather unhappy sex life. But he um, uh, came to sexual fruition in the forties and fifties, and with all the hell that that involved. And um, he took us. He took what I re regard as being a really remarkable and important view on the sexual revolution in the sixties, which is that most people of his generation, most older people, resented the young. Um, they resented the freedom they had, and actually, they they pretended the freedom was terrible, and it was always getting lightly done. And Philip Larkin, rather surprisingly, he was a very conservative person, took a different view, and he says it in his poem. And the opening of the poem is he says. When I see a couple of kids and guess he's fucking her and she's taking pills or wearing a diaphragm, I know this is paradise. Everyone old has dreamed of all their lives. Bonds and gestures pushed to one side like an outdated combine harvester and everyone young going down the long slide to happiness endlessly. I wonder if anyone looked at me 40 years back and thought, That'll be the life, no God anymore, or sweating in the dark about hell and that, or having to hide what you think of the priest. He and his lot will all go down the long slide like free bloody birds. And immediately, rather than words, comes the thought of high windows, the sun-comprehending glass, and beyond it the deep blue air that shows nothing and is nowhere and is endless. The divine, he found it. He found it in seeing a couple of young kids and knowing that one of them was wearing a diaphragm. <laughs> Do you see what, I mean, it's, first of all, it's very counterintuitive, but secondly, this is the point that sex had been so tied up with misery. I mean, people don't remember this now when they talk about the past. I mean, there's a, one of my favorite books, Stefan Zweig's The World of Yesterday. You know, descriptions of what it was like you know, trying to have sex in pre-First World War Vienna. You know, all the men ended up going to female prostitutes. And they, you know, so many of them got syphilis. And this was their first experience of sex. It was so goddamn awful, and they were stuck with it all their lives. And it, so there, there's lots of stuff that's gone better in our last century, and that's one of them. But you ask about love. Yes, I, I do think that love is basically... Um, um, uh, The, the thing that gives us the best glimpse of the divine. And by the way, sex, liberating sex, doesn't buy you um, love. No. Either. I mean, it throws in an entirely, it, it threw in another set of problems. <laughs> um, if, if there's any meaning on top of all of that is we like to um, find problems and solve that as a human species. And sometimes we even create problems. Um, Douglas, thank you for highlighting all the problems of human civilization and giving us a glimmer of hope for the future. This is an incredible conversation. Thank you for talking today, it's a huge honor, thank you. It's very kind of you to say that, thank you. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Douglas Murray. To support this podcast, please check out our sponsors in the description. And now let me leave you with some words from Douglas Murray himself. Disagreement is not oppression. Argument is not assault. Words, even provocative and repugnant ones, are not violence. The answer to speech we do not like is more speech. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time.